<sighs> I think I've solved the mystery. The mystery that began in a previous episode. The mystery of what exactly Jerry Lee said to Chuck Berry at that show in Europe that was dramatized in Great Balls of Fire and why he said it to him. Or if not, what was actually said at the time, why it was so confusing in the film. And the answer lies with Henry Rollins. If you don't know Henry Rollins, I highly recommend any interview with him where he's talking about famous rock and roll folks and meeting them. Whether it's Ike Turner or Lemmy, Kilmister of Motorhead, or you know, maybe Ozzy Osbourne or David Lee Roth. His, David, his meeting David Lee Roth story is amazing because he it was it was in the mid '80s when he met him. Henry Rollins is a gentleman who rose to prominence as singer in a hardcore punk band called Black Flag in, let's say, the mid '80s ish era of California, Southern California punk, and. Since then, he's moved on to have a solo career in the Rollins Band, but mostly a publishing career and a writing career and a public speaking career. And he now has a podcast called Henry and Heidi with his partner uh, in podcasting, Heidi May. And in an episode from 2017, September 7th, 2017 to be exact, he talks about meeting Jerry Lee Lewis. Now, my initial confusion came from the dramatization of this moment backstage at a theater gig, and I think it was in, I think it was in England, and uh, the sort of contractual conflict of Chuck Berry going f- before Jerry Lee or after Jerry Lee, Jerry Lee didn't want to, and Jerry Lee doing this big, amazing set, and by some accounts... Lighting the piano on fire, by some accounts, that never happened. And then strutting off stage to confront Chuck Berry, waiting in the wings, and saying, follow that killer in the film. According to the Nick Toshi's book, Hellfire, the wording was something different entirely. It was, follow that N-word that rhymes with killer or rhymes with digger, let's say. Something incredibly inflammatory and disrespectful and pointed to let Chuck Berry know just how angry Jerry Lee was. And in the previous episode that I talked about that, I was, I was mystified. I was like, why would he say, follow that killer? Like, because Jerry Lee Lewis is the killer. And I, I mean, I first heard that on the, uh, on the Johnny Cash film, Walk the, Walk the Line, you know, when he tells Johnny Cash, nobody follows the killer. I think I'll probably have to get to Johnny Cash via that film eventually, but I'll have to pair it up with another old timier, harder to find movie that has more story to tell because a lot of folks saw Walk the Line and are familiar with it already. There's a lot of weird cowboy footage of Johnny Cash in that Hurt video that came out when he died. I got to find out what the hell all that was from. Maybe, that's, maybe, there's a, maybe there's a movie in there somewhere I can review as well. But back to Great Balls of Fire. That stuck in my craw as being something weird and revisionist. And then I became privy to two different sources that helped me solve the mystery. I've decided. Like any good detective, I've decided I've solved the mystery just by there being no real proof and no one to actually call me on it or verify it or disprove me um besides the henry and heidi or heidi and henry podcast there was chuck berry's hail hill rock and roll now on blu-ray go down to your corner store and purchase this blu-ray disc 
uh, as soon as you can if you love rock and roll. If you really want to know everything there is to know about Jerry Lee Lewis as a man from one interview, and I don't mean his history, I mean the kind of person he would be like to be in a room with and probably make you pretty uncomfortable. I say, purchase Chuck Berry, Hail, Hail, Rock and Roll, directed by Taylor Hackford on Blu-ray disc, or at your local Pirate Bay torrenting site. Uh, but I don't think the torrent's going to have all the, all the extra documentary stuff, so don't do that. <laughs> There's a section in the extras on the Blu-ray where Jerry Lee Lewis is, is interviewed for quite some time. And Jerry Lee Lewis is cut into the film as well with his interviews. But if you want to know what Jerry Lee's all about and what he, what if, how uncomfortable it could be to be in the room with him while he's talking and drinking, I would say watch the unedited full interview footage with him on that Chuck Berry disc. Ironically, it's, it's going to teach you more about Jerry Lee than, it's, than the film Great Balls of Fire ever will. And he discusses Chuck Berry, among other things, in this interview. And he... And he says that he and Chuck used to fight in the early days when they would go on tours together. And the director, uh, Taylor Hackford, asks him, what did, you, what did you fight about? Why were you fighting? And he goes, because he said he was the king of rock and roll, and I said I was. And then one time we got to fighting about it, and he taught me a lesson. He taught me he was the king of rock and roll. I'm paraphrasing, but that's the gist of it. Now, back to Henry Rollins. Henry Rollins is going to interview Jerry Lee Lewis with uh, accompaniment from a representative of Electra Records. And perhaps they were both on the same record label at the same time or something like that, but they, they drive to Jerry Lee's estate with full permission of Jerry himself and his representatives. And Henry talks about being prepped for the interview by Jerry Lee Lewis's manager at that time, Jerry Schilling. And if you don't know Jerry Schilling, um, you may not have read anything about Elvis. Jerry Schilling is one of Elvis's bodyguards, one of the Memphis Mafia. He's there when Elvis meets Richard Nixon and has to tell the Secret Service agent that's trying to keep him away from <laughs> the president that, uh, no, no, I need half this door. And the Secret Service agent is like, well, I, I guard the door and I guard the president. No one gets in, you know. And Jerry Schilling is like, yeah, but I guard Elvis. <laughs> so, so he gets half the door <laughs> because Elvis is at least half as important as Richard Nixon at the time. Oh, so he's working for Jerry Lee now. And he tells Henry Rollins this very bulky, large, tattooed man, healthy, articulate, uh, respectful, but energetic and bodybuilder type, especially compared to other people in punk rock and heavy metal and rock and roll in general, uh, can be an intimidating man. But I think by most accounts, when it comes to meeting his elders, he's very polite and respectful and has manners. He says to Henry, now, if he likes you, He'll call you killer. If he doesn't like you, he'll call you boy. And if you make him mad, he'll reach over and thwack you on the nose like this. <laughs> you flick yourself on the nose, it really, really hurts. And apparently that means this discussion is over. This interview has ended. And I highly recommend checking out that episode of, of the... Uh, Henry and Heidi podcast, where Henry Rollins tells the whole story of his interview with the killer himself. Uh, it, is, it is so very cool, but I'm not going to tell his story here because Henry tells stories for a living and deserves your support for doing so. I'm not going to rip that off. There's some great stuff about the, the very first piano that Jerry Lee ever had and what sort of shape it was in. Uh, after young Jerry Lee Lewis just banged the hell out of the keys for so long when he was learning to play. But the point of all this is, I really do believe it is entirely possible that young, angry Jerry Lee Lewis was so pissed off at Chuck Berry, he did 
call him that word. He did use a racial slur. And then after their fights, later on in his career, he, he thought better of Chuck. And when it came time for the film, I want to believe that he had that exchange edited to reflect how much he liked Chuck Berry and respected Chuck Berry. Although you wouldn't know it from the way the dramatized character of him treated Chuck Berry. I think that was a bit of, that one word exchange was a bit of revisionist history to put right some things that were wrong. A wink and a nod for only the two of them, perhaps. If I, you know, if Chuck Berry ever saw that film. Or someone told Chuck about it. Now, in recompense, or as recompense to Chuck Berry, is that how it works? Is that me using, I'm using that, that word correctly? I, I would like to retroactively sort of give him a swing. Let's, let's put it that way. This takes place in 1973 on a European tour. Chuck is getting more and more antsy because things are happening at the show that are delaying his time to go on stage. It was striking 9 p.m. This is, by the way, from Chuck Berry, the autobiography, uh, published in mid-1980s, around 86 or so. So, before Great Balls of Fire came out, if, you know, if that has anything to do with your understanding of the timeline of conflict here. Maybe, maybe if Great Balls of Fire had come out first and I was right about the whole replacement of that particular word, this, this would have been smoothed over. Probably not. It was striking 9 p.m. when we parked under the stage on which some English band was performing at the time. When they finished, it was close to 11 p.m. and another act came on before Jerry Lee Lewis was to hit. The long intermission to set up Lewis's equipment, plus the two announcements to get his presence on stage, took until 1.20 a.m. I was contracted to perform a 45-minute show beginning at 11.45 p.m. There I was, sitting in the rented car by the stage all this time, waiting for Jerry to come on. I was hungry, cold, bored, and angry. And at last, he finally showed on stage, high as a Russian kite. His band started to tune. He inspected the musicians and set up before deciding to stop the tune and start a vocal number. The melodic lyrics to it were sort of spoken in a monotone and occasionally... The bottle he brought on with him was visited for a hit between verses. In fact, he was drinking at a rate so frequent, he wouldn't have known where he was if the bells of St. Mary had rung in his ear. It takes a numerator of soberness in a denominator like Jerry Lee to find the quotient of his drunkenness. He was bombed. This went on for over a half hour, while my empty stomach, freezing skin, impatient head, and disappointed heart awaited his exit off stage. Finally fed up, I told Dick I was going on regardless of Lewis still being on, just to make a showing that I'd been there to the audience and the promoter, who we'd not even been able to locate. For the first time ever, I invaded another artist's performance and joined in with my guitar, playing Great Balls of Fire. And I thought there would be for walking in on Jerry Lee. When I came on stage, Jerry appeared confused, but jolly and joyful as could be. He arose and met me mid-stage. He welcomed me on, put his arms around me, and even announced my name as if my appearance had all been planned. I bowed and joined him in rocking out great balls of fire. We jammed for about eight minutes in which I danced my duck walk and did my scoots and splits, waving to the audience. I was so elated at his presentation, knowing from past contact that he could care less for a black invader upon his show, that I sang and danced 50 minutes. The fans cheered my exit, and I left the show to Jerry. Dick and I shook hands and left Germany. Now, shifting away from those times and way back in the past to Sun Records, I want to talk um, a little more about some, some... Eyewitnesses that worked in the studio with Jerry Lee Lee. Lee Lee. Jerry Lee. And uh, one of them is 
a fella by the name of, I think it's Jack Riley. Billy Lee Riley, excuse me. Billy Lee Riley uh, has some words to say <laughs> about those days. Um, he says, in, in speaking about Sam Phillips, of course, owner, operator of Sun Records, Sam had done nothing as far as discovering me. Jack discovered me. That's Jack Clement, and we're going to probably read from him here in a second. Sam gets a lot of credit for discovering artists. He takes credit for discovering Jerry Lee Lewis, but Jerry Lee Lewis just walked in the studio one morning when I came in here, and he didn't know anybody. We introduced ourselves, and I gave him a job working with me, working with my band. J.M. Van Eaton was the drummer. Roland James was the guitar player. Pat O'Neill was the bass player, replacing Marvin Pepper, who started with me. Martin Willis was my horn man. That's the group that played on... 80% of everything that came out of Sun from 1957 to 1959, all of us together, or parts of us. The piano player I hired after Jerry quit was Jimmy Wilson, and Jimmy Wilson played on sessions with everybody. J.M. was the first drummer Cash used. All Jerry's stuff, it was usually Roland, me, and J.M. And then J.W. Brown came to town and started playing bass. Before he came, I would play bass, or Roland would. But that first session we did with Jerry Lee was truly accidental. Sam Phillips wasn't even here when that one happened. Crazy Arms was not planned. And just to pause, you know, we covered the recording of Crazy Arms in a previous episode, but uh, I think it's worthwhile having another eyewitness's account of how it went down. We was just out there jamming, and it was released, and I happened to get the last note on guitar on it. Remember that from the story on the previous episode, that last guitar strum that was not in key. <laughs> I think that's what he's referring to. The way it happened, Roland Janes and JM and Jerry Lee and I were in the studio just jamming. And I think we were in there to do something for somebody else because, like I said, we did all the sessions back then. When the song first started, it was only JM and Jerry Lee playing the song. Roland was in the John... And I was in the studio playing around on an upright bass, which I can't play at all. I wasn't playing on mic or anything, but Jerry and JM were doing their thing. And nobody knows Jack has the machines on. Nobody knows this. So Roland comes out of the john, comes into the studio at the same time that I put the bass down. He picks it up and starts to play it as I pick up his guitar. I sit down, and about the time I'm ready to play, Jerry Lee's about done with the song, and I hit that one chord. Bring, and that's the only one they released. You hear all these stories that it was all planned and this and that, but that is the true story. It was very frantic working with Jerry Lee. This isn't anything that everybody doesn't already know, but he had a big ego. And he was always thought, excuse me, he always thought that he was the best there ever was, and nobody ever takes that away from him. He was talented. But he lost a lot of that talent by bragging on himself all the time, as far as I was concerned. He didn't need to brag. You could just watch him and know how good he was. But he was not easy to work with. Sometimes he just wanted Jerry Lee on the record, and if he didn't hear enough of him, he didn't like that. But a lot of times he would come in and the session would go real good. Then we'd come in here and sit all night and it would be nothing but total confusion. Now that is from Sun Records and Oral History, uh, compiled by David Marsh. We're going to go over to a fellow by the name of um, Roland Janes, who is a session guitarist at Sun Records from the same compilation of interviews. He said, and this is not his voice, this is, this is me taking liberties with it, but they're his words. I think Jerry Lee is probably the most misunderstood man in the world. Jerry Lee is Jerry Lee, and all of us want to be taken for what we are, but he's what he is. Jerry Lee Lewis will give you the shirt off his back and is one of the greatest guys in the world. But at the same time, he's got a bit of a chip on his shoulder and he also won't take anything off of anybody. But he's one of the finest people in the world, man, and one of the greatest talents. Stop and think about it. A guy as great as Jerry Lee was, 
there were going to be a lot of people jealous of the man because you could have had a hundred piano players come in in a room and they could be really good piano players. And Jerry Lee sits down at the piano and it's all over with. All the piano players and everybody will gather around Jerry Lee. I worked on the road with Jerry for a long time and we had package shows where we had Chuck Berry and the Everly Brothers, Buddy Holly, you name it. 17, 18, 20 acts on the show. And all of them with hit records. After the show, they closed the curtains. And Jerry Lee would sit down at the piano and start playing and singing. And all these stars would gather around him like they were teenage fans. That's how much talent the man had. But at the same time, there was some animosity toward him and some jealousy of him. But he wasn't like that. On the road, he was just strictly a showman, more or less. He did what the people wanted to hear. We'd had people close the shows on us several times because people thought he was too wild. But the shows were not like they are now. You can get away with anything now. But then if you wiggled your butt a little bit, they wanted to close the curtain on you. He wasn't vulgar. He did a couple of things that maybe he shouldn't have done, but I've seen other people do much worse. He was really very religious oriented. It depended on the audience reaction and where we were at and the quality of the piano. He used to be given some pretty bad pianos to play. People didn't realize how important the instrument was to him. A lot of the wild stuff he did on piano would be out of frustration because they'd give him pianos that maybe five or six of the notes didn't play. Back then, we didn't make demands and like you do these days. Like, the piano has to be so-and-so with a certain sheen and the polish. And back then, we didn't ask for anything. We just took what they gave us, and he'd sometimes get kind of frustrated with it. A lot of people think he was jealous of Elvis. He wasn't jealous of Elvis. In his mind, he thought he was a much better performer than Elvis. And who's to say he wasn't? There's two different trains of thought. Elvis was a heartthrob type performer, and Jerry Lee was a knockdown, drag out, go get him type of guy. They were both great in their own field. I would have loved to have seen them on stage together. I think they would have had a ball. They were actually good friends. People don't know that. Elvis had a great amount of respect for Jerry Lee, and Jerry Lee had a great amount of respect for Elvis. Now, they could each do a song, and it would sound totally different. With Jerry, we never did that many of Elvis's songs. And usually the ones we did, we'd just take a couple of takes on them and go on to something else. But they approached the song from two totally different directions and from different perspectives. Elvis played instruments. He played guitar and played rhythm on the piano. But he wasn't a musician like Jerry Lee. See, you have to look at Jerry Lee like this. The piano is an extension of Jerry Lee. It was part of him. What he sang and what he played was like a hand in a glove. And Elvis sang to what somebody else played, if you know what I mean. But they were both great in their own way. I think they had a tremendous amount of respect for each other. People have never really seen Jerry Lee do all that he is capable of as a piano player. The man could play anything. He could play more with his left hand than most people could with their right hand. He can do equally well on both hands. A lot of these solos you're hearing on these piano things... The slow things, it's half his right hand, half his left hand. People just can't do that, but he does. Jerry Lee was an original. He can take a song and he'll rewrite your song for you, not with a pencil and paper. And you'll end up with a better song than you had when you sat down with it. And he'll add some stuff on the piano that makes it great. Now, I take it back. I don't think we're going to jump into a Jack Clement story here. I think I want to move on to a couple of other incidents uh, and a few other books, but... Definitely recommend Sun Records and Oral History if you want to hear some of the stories about what went down in that studio. It's, it's very easy to snag a, a used copy of right now. It's a, and it's a small book. It's a fun thing you can kind of jump in and out of, as with a lot of great oral histories. Now, I want to jump to the life story of an Irish singer, songwriter, and blues guitarist by the name of Rory Gallagher. Rory Gallagher is my favorite guitarist, and not my whole life, but as I got older and discovered what a fiery <laughs> blues player he was and, and folk music uh, player and singer, I guess. 
I don't know. I just love what the guy does. And uh, there's a chunk of his biography that covers interaction with Jerry Lee Lewis in uh, the 70s, I believe. And we're talking Rory Gallagher, a biography translated by Lorna Carlson or Carson and Brian Steer, written by Jean-Noël Coy, uh, spelled C-O-G-H-E. I'm sure I'm pronouncing it wrong. Apologies to all French people who love rock and roll everywhere. You can uh, call in and, and help correct me on how the pronunciation is supposed to go. So I'll read straight from the text again because I feel like it. <laughs> I, I don't feel like this is too, too terrible a copyright infringement to read you know, a couple of pages straight out. The killer, Jerry Lee Lewis, was in London, the city which had hunted him down in the 1960s when Jerry Lee Lewis had married his 14-year-old cousin. Lewis was now in London to record a double album, bringing together a dazzling array of musicians, hitherto never seen together, all united for the maddest of rock stars. Taking part in this historic session were, amongst others, Alvin Lee, Pete Frampton, Kenny Jones, B.J. Cole, Albert Lee, Delaney Bramlett, Klaus Vorman. I think Klaus Vorman is the guy that was in uh, the, the, the artist that did the Beatles revolver cover artwork, among maybe one other. And he was dramatized in Backbeat, a movie about the Beatles in Hamburg, which I have covered in a previous episode. Please go listen to it. It's a wonderful film and a nice episode. Uh, Vorman and Rory Gallagher. With Jerry Lee Lewis, Rory said, everything is different. He sits down at the piano and the tracks pour out. As one track followed another, the musicians started to mix and mingle. Rory teamed up with Kenny Jones, Albert Lee, and Pete Frampton for Music to the Man, Jukebox, Johnny Be Good, and a whole lot of shaking going on. Throughout the session, Lewis looked for ideas for tracks. The old favorites were in the can, and he wanted something a little different. Someone suggested the Rolling Stones. Okay, which track? Lewis asked. The musicians proposed satisfaction, to which Lewis demanded, Which one's that? He didn't know it. The others, flabbergasted, ended up laughing, whereas Lewis was furious. He sincerely thought they were teasing him. His anger grew when he found out that the song did actually exist. He made everyone leave the studio apart from Rory, whom he had read correctly. Rory wasn't one of the arrogant, conceited crowd you meet in London, Alone with him, Lewis suggested that they work on the song together and asked him to write out the words. On reading the lyrics and grasping their connotations, Lewis exclaimed, They got to number one with that and I got myself arrested for bullshit. Calming down, he asked for an electric piano to be brought in, rehearsed the song, called back the musicians, and after a cursory once over, they recorded. He hammered the keyboard with his feet came up with a good cover, which was later to appear uncut on Volume 2. During the same recording session, Lewis attacked Kenny Jones from the faces. As ever, Kenny was elegant, wearing a tartan jacket. Jerry considered him better dressed than himself, something he could not tolerate. Delaney Bramlett then suddenly arrived into the studio with a bottle of bourbon, which was actually forbidden. Lewis, however, hit the bottle, and once again, in a fit of moodiness, got angry with all the musicians over something trifling, and made them all leave the studio, all except Rory. Making the most of the break, Donald came back in the studio to modify something on Rory's amp, and Donald is Rory's brother. Jerry, catching sight of him, asked him what he was doing there, to which Donald replied, I'm fixing Rory's amp. Right, if you're with Rory, that's fine, Jerry sat down at the piano. It's a shame you're not doing any of your country tracks, commented <laughs> Donald. Uh, excuse me for pronouncing it, commented. Commented, Donal. Donal? Donal? Cut to the quick, Lewis aggressively replied, You're far too young to know anything about country music. The first record I ever heard on the radio was Guy Mitchell's Singing the Blues, said Donal. At that, Jerry started playing the first few notes of the song. And suddenly, perking up, he was back in a good mood. He decided to record the song, called all the musicians back, and asked Donald to pr provide some backing vocals. 
a great respect had been established between Jerry and Rory by the end of that rather epic recording session. Sometime afterwards, Rory was on tour in America. The group were to play the Civic Hall in Santa Monica and in the town at the hotel. Huge posters of Rory had been stuck up, along with the posters of Jerry Lee Lewis, who was playing his country repertoire at a small venue called the Roxy. Lewis invited Rory to his concert, sending complimentary tickets, and Rory, having the evening off, went along with Donal and Tom. On welcoming them, the club's manager, Mario, told them not to sit in the main theater, as it would be packed. And moreover, with country fans, there was often a bit of trouble. He told them that he had a private box reserved for VIPs, and that they were welcome to sit up there. Donal explained that Rory didn't really like sitting with the guests of honor and would rather be with the rest of the audience. As they went to sit down, Mario added that he had some other guests coming later and that they would love to meet Rory. Okay, we'll see about that later, Rory replied. The show began. The first half was a country group, Cousins of Lewis, and his son, Lovely, who was later to die in a car crash. Lewis finally arrived on stage an hour late and not apparently in top form. He sat down at the piano, fixed his mic, and played his first few chords. As he was finishing his second song, his guests made their entrance which did not go unremarked, for amongst them were John Lennon and Yoko Ono. Rumors had been escalating for several days that the Beatles were about to split up. Turning their eyes away from the stage, the entire audience shifted round to look at Lennon. Lewis started his third song to complete indifference, and in the general hubbub provoked by John Lennon, livid, Lewis changed the words of the song throwing some particularly vulgar lyrics, of which the least offensive were, Me, I'm far better than the Beatles. Lennon leaned across the balcony towards the stage and shouted at Lewis, I don't like the Beatles either! That's why we've split! But with the noise of the piano, although Lewis saw that Lennon was talking to him, he couldn't hear what he was saying. He thought Lennon was returning his digs and insults, and that his bad humor... And then his bad humor turned to anger. In a rage... He pushed the Steinway piano into the audience. A fight broke out in the ensuing chaos. There was complete panic. Rory, Donald, and Tom were in the thick of it. And although Donald suggested they they go back to their hotel, Rory refused. All musicians have their bad days when they feel tense and down, and Jerry Lee's feeling bad, he said. It's when your friends feel bad that they need your support. Rory decided to go and find Lewis in his dressing room. Tom borrowed Donald's backstage pass and accompanied him. Whereas Tom got lost in the wings, Rory managed to make his way without any hassle into Lewis's dressing room, only to discover him sitting on a chair, his head between his legs and a glass of bourbon in his hand. Rory talked to him, managing to calm him down. You know, he said, Lennon is a fan of you and your music. He wouldn't come here to insult you. When he talks about you, it's with respect. Listening to Rory, Jerry Lee was just starting to relax when the dressing room door opened and Lennon made his entrance. His appearance stunned Lewis, and he thrust his hand into his bag, looking for something to throw at Lennon in an attempt to alleviate his anger. Rory leapt up and stood between them, grabbing Lewis's hand and reasoning with him while explaining the reasons for his anger to John. Just when things had calmed down and both men had accepted the misunderstanding, the door opened once again and Tom came in. His eyes moved from Rory to Jerry Lee Lewis to John Lennon. He gulped, took a piece of paper and a pencil from his pocket, and landed in front of Lennon saying, For me, you're the king of rock and roll. Would you give me your autograph? As Lewis rolled his eyes, Lennon took the paper and pencil and signed his name. Lewis was bright red, apoplectic with rage. Rory stood motionless. Tom, who hadn't a clue what had been going on, carefully put away his precious autograph. Lennon then asked to borrow Tom's pencil and paper and moved towards the transfixed Lewis knelt down on the floor in front of him and declared you're the king of rock and roll I've been waiting for this moment for 20 years would you give me your autograph this Lewis did more or less graciously as Lennon got up the two men fell into each other's arms hugging congratulating each other Rory breathed again his role as mediator had prevented things deteriorating Rory didn't enter any further into conversation with Lennon, not wanting to annoy Lewis, who was back in good humor once again. Thus, Lennon was the special guest who had wanted to meet Rory.
want to jump into some liner notes from Colin Escott now. Colin wrote the liner notes for all the tracks on the Rhino Records compilation. Loud, fast, and out of control. The wild sounds of 50s rock. And if you can get it, get it. If you can't get it easily and cheaply, well, no one can get it cheaply, but uh, just go to Spotify. <laughs> Look up Loud, Fast, and Out of Control on YouTube, music, Spotify, whatever, any streaming service that people can create their own playlist and someone has replicated it. Now, I'm not going to read everything verbatim, but just a few notes. Uh, when he talks about breathless he says it's jerry lee's barely controlled frenzy against a mellow precise guitar what's lacking is the southernness that infused his greatest music it only surfaces here and there as on you know i boin like wood in flame the record wasn't doing too well until sun engineered a promotional tie-in with dick clark and beech nut chewing gum in which kids could send in 50 cents and five beech nut wrappers to receive a quote-unquote, autographed copy of the single. Everyone at Sun Records' tiny operation, including lesser artists, was, to, was put to work autographing and mailing. <laughs> Clark plugged Breathless relentlessly, propelling it into the top ten. And he had a good relationship with Jerry Lee, of course, until all the scandal happened, and he had to sort of distance himself from Jerry Lee and stop playing the records, which he, Jerry Lee Lewis loves reiterating the fact that Dick Clark apologized to him for that later and, and, uh, and said publicly that he was wrong for doing so. I read that note about the beach nut chewing gum just to sort of, I don't know, help contextualize rock and roll promotion in the 50s. I mean, these songs were amazing and they're all fighting at the same time in this explosive time of, of new rock and roll music for everyone's attention. So, um, On the subject of a whole lot of shaking going on, Let's see. It says, in the opening four bars, the piano becomes a percussion instrument. Then, in feeding the signal back upon itself just at just the right increment of tape delay, Sun Records boss Sam Phillips fattened this sound to the point that the record throbs with its own hypnotic life by the time J.M. Van Eaton's drums come in. Van Eaton is exactly where he needs to be on this record. He hits a shuffle between the first and second verses and sets up the solo with a roll. This was Jerry Lee's second record. A song first recorded in 1955 by blues singer Big Maybell and singer Roy Hall, who always claimed to be the song's mysterious co-writer, Sonny David. Playing it on club dates, Jerry Lee refashioned Shaken in his image, stripping away the opening couplet and inserting a half-spoken segment before storming back to close with a triumphant glissando. On the subject of Great Balls of Fire... He says, in the wake of Whole Lot of Shaken, Jerry Lee and another Sun artist, Carl Perkins, were offered spots on an in upcoming movie, Jamboree. Part of the deal was they must record songs supplied by the production company. Perkins passed on Great Balls of Fire. Imagine, oh, excuse me, Jerry Lee took it, and at this point, it's hard to imagine anyone but him doing it. Technically, there's a guitar on the session, although it's essentially piano and drums. The tape delay echo almost counts as a third instrument because it adds so much presence and depth. Clearly someone counseled against finesse because Jerry's solo is simplicity itself. There are four sweeping glissandi. He then hammers at the same note for six bars. Looking at the sheet music, Perkins must have thought he had a case for nixing the song, but Jerry Lee's peculiar, uh, peculiar genius breathed life into Otis Blackwell's slight novelty. And then one more note, and this is not about a Jerry Lee Lewis song, but a Warren Smith song called You Bangy Stomp. <laughs> and he was, a, uh, he was a Sun Records guy. And, uh, and the author notes that Warren toured with the Sun Stars. In later years, they told everyone they were pulling for each other. But that wasn't the case. Warren and Carl Perkins fought constantly with Jerry Lee Lewis, remembered Smith's drummer, Jimmy Lott. They sit around before the show with a fifth of Old Crow. Old Crow is a very inexpensive brand of whiskey for anyone that doesn't know or hasn't achieved those particular depths of rancid 
violent depression in their life. Probably specifically an American experience, brand wise. Jerry or Warren would say, I've got a big record out. I'm going on last. Carl's brother Clayton would stick out his jaw and say, if you're going on last, we're going to fight. And they did. So I want to jump to Edward's History of Rock and Roll, Volume 1. And I want to read straight from his text of his summary of the whole incident over in England when the scandal broke. Jerry Lee Lewis, for his part, was racking up hits with Breathless coming first and then High School Confidential, so titled because he played it at the start of the film of the same name, on an upright piano on a flatbed truck with his band in front of the high school where the film's action, a sordid tale of dope, sex, and Mamie Van Doren, would unfold. And a quick side note, thanks to the folks who wrote 45 RPM, the history heroes and villains of a pop music revolution, Jim Dawson and Steve Propes, Propose, Propes, uh, they actually point out that during the entire decade of the 50s, according to them, Sun Records only released three 45s with picture sleeves. <clears throat> that is, you know, a non-blank sleeve, I guess, with just letters on it. Uh, and two of them were Jerry Lee Lewis's Great Balls of Fire and High School Confidential. The other one was Johnny Cash's Guess Things Happen That Way. A great song, even with the ba doo ba that Sam Phillips added to the recording after Johnny Cash wasn't around, I believe is the story I'm getting from the, uh, from the folks at Sun Records and that other book we mentioned previously. Anyway, back to Edward. My point with that aside was just to sort of emphasize how much stock Sun Records was putting in Jerry Lee Lewis at this time and how much, you know, they really were leaning on him right now. As mentioned in previous episodes, you know, uh, one or two other artists had already flown the coop and moved on to bigger things. In May, a British promoter set up a tour and Jerry Lee took an entourage, including his sister, Linda Gale, and his new wife, Myra Gale, spelled G-A-L-E, Linda's middle name was G-A-I-L. As with many American stars, a press conference was set up at the airport, and Myra wanted to share the spotlight with her husband. This was not a good idea. They'd gotten married in Mississippi in December, and both Sam and Judd Phillips had urged Jerry Lee to hush it up. For one thing, nobody was sure of the status of his two previous wives, one of whom he may not have finished divorcing. For another thing, Myra Gale was Jerry Lee's third cousin. Her father was his bass player. And Heathrow, Judd Phillips, who was along as tour manager, suggested Jerry Lee leave her behind while he went out to talk to the press, but she wanted to stick by his side. And Jerry Lee told Judd, Look, people want me and they're going to get me no matter what. Oscar Davis, Jerry Lee's new manager, begged him, but the star dug in his heels. And he went into the press conference. Immediately, one of the reporters asked who the girl was. This is my wife, Myra, he said, a bit defensively. The next, next question was how old she was. Fifteen, said Jerry Lee. Then someone asked her if that wasn't a bit young. And she answered cheerily, Oh, no, not at all. Age doesn't matter back home. You can marry at ten if you can find a husband. This wasn't true. The current age of consent in Mississippi was 17. And she told the judge performing the wedding that she was 20. When news of the press conference hit the United States, a reporter at the Memphis paper did a little digging and discovered that she wasn't 15 at all. She was 13. And the Phillips's suspicion was well-founded. Jerry Lee's latest divorce wouldn't be final for five more months. The first concert of the tour was a disaster. Empty seats outnumbered full ones in a 25% full house. The next night, the hall had hecklers calling him a sissy and a cradle robber. The next night, there was no show. The promoter canceled the tour, and the Americans flew back home. 
but not before being mobbed by reporters and photographers at the airport, causing Jerry Lee to kick a photographer. It was the same in the United States. Jerry Lee insisted he hadn't been deported, which he hadn't been, and said he'd gotten homesick, which he might have been. But it wasn't the reason he was back. To the question of whether his bride was a bit young, Jerry Lee seethed, You can put this down, she's a woman, and stomped off. Sam Phillips might have been reeling, although he paid for and ghost wrote a full page ad in Billboard in which Jerry Lee defended himself after a fashion. And although High School Confidential was still selling, Dick Clark had served notice to Oscar Davis that he wasn't going to book him again. A very cowardly act, for which I've been very sorry ever since. Clark admitted in his autobiography. But Sam was having other woes. Carl Perkins and Johnny Cash had both signed with Columbia. He hadn't held on to Roy Orbison, whom the Everly Brothers had wooed away with a big publishing contract with A. Cuff Rose, and his roster of stars was running low. That summer, he'd watch as Harold Jenkins, who'd recorded some stuff at Sun that didn't get released, took a page from Vernon Dahlhart's book and put two Texas towns together for a stage name, and, as Conway Twitty, had a smash hit on MGM with It's Only Make Believe. Jerry Lee was just about all Sam had until he could develop another star. So to his credit, he stuck with him, at least for a little while. Now I want to get deeper into that little uh, <laughs> impromptu press conference at the airport when they got to London. Um, there, when the reporters confronted Der- Jerry Lee and his wife at Heathrow on May 22nd, after the part previously recounted where they asked how old his wife was and he tells them 15, they asked more about, uh, about if this was his first wife and how long he'd been married to Myra. Jerry Lee says, we were married two months ago and we're very happy. Um, furthermore, he said, my first wife was named Dorothy. I was 15 when I married her. She was 17. The marriage lasted only a year. My second wife was Jane. We were both 16 when we married. It was a long marriage, lasted four years. We had a son called Jerry Lee. He's three now. All right. That's a lot to give up to the reporters who just are probably salivating and writing all this down. Um, Then, of course, they ask again, you know, if she thinks it's too young to be married, no, you can get married at 10 if you can find a husband. And then, this is sort of what the uh, paper publishes the day of, I believe, his first show there in England on Friday. <laughs> the London Daily Herald has a great big photo taken at the airport of Jerry Lee and Myra Gale embracing. And in bold black letters are the words, Rock star's wife is 15, and it's his third marriage, exclamation point. I didn't didn't rock star. I didn't realize the the term went back that far. That's that's interesting. Uh, And then back home in Memphis, Sam Phillips at Sun Records is reading the Memphis Press Scimitar and sees a headline that says, Jerry Lee Lewis weds. Like, as an announcement, as a, as, a, as a wedding announcement. Because it's, you know, back home. And it's not scandal, scandal, scandal headline. It's, oh, local star Jerry Lee Lewis got married, right? <laughs> so, what happens is, um, there's a Memphis reporter named Clark Portios had done some digging after getting the news about the whole London expose. And now... Uh, he reveals in the paper that their marriage took place almost exactly five months before Lewis was divorced by his second wife, and that Myra's birth certificate reveals she was born on July 11, 1944, which lets everybody know how young she is at this point. Now, back to London. Telephone rings in Jerry Lee Lewis's hotel room. Myra Gale answers the phone. And it was his former wife, Jane, calling to wish her ex-husband luck. And she tells Myra she's still in love with Jerry Lee. Myra replies, I'm going to have to say, with more wherewithal and presentation that I'm sure most of us at the age of 13 in this situation could have ever mustered, 
but I'm living with him, and you're not. <laughs> this is what I'm saying about my critique about the film. That's the story I want. I want the whole thing from Myra's point of view. I want it like it was intended, intended to be because it was, it was bought on the pretense of it being an adaptation of her memoirs, right? Or crying out loud, just if you could have given us a whole movie with Winona Ryder playing Myra Gale and the whole story from her point of view, this could have been, Great Balls of Fire could have been an unbelievably good film that we could still watch today with, without, you know, being so uncomfortable by the shifts in tone and, and the lack of loyalty to any one character that it, the narrative kind of has. It would make you uncomfortable for the right reasons, is what I'm saying. It would, you know, if you, if you would watch from her perspective and see what, <laughs> probably a hero she is coming through at all, um, yeah, you, you would be uncomfortable because she's uncomfortable. Because she's confused and is thrown into a situation that she didn't ask for. From her perspective, she's just in love with a person that she's been around her whole life, that she's probably admired and being a bit in awe of for being a, a very exciting individualistic person around a lot of other people that are just willing to go along to get along and you know get through life doing whatever they're not they don't have his talent they don't have his charisma and charm and she i'm sure was completely bowled over by his romantic interest in her and obsession with her that's the movie i want but you know what else i want the other movie too they should have shown him just being abusive and obnoxious for the whole movie, you know? I mean, ripping rings off of Frosty Barley Pops and f drinking from other people's flasks and throwing bucketfuls of pills down his throat nonstop. Show me that movie. I put, like, you could put Kaneda's jacket on him from Akira, the one with the big, the big pill on the back. I mean, he is a, he's a maniac. All right, sorry, the Akira reference is a bit out there, but not everyone's going to get that. But give it the point of view of this guy who's brilliant and unhinged and constantly confused in a rock and roll trailblazer that can't understand why people won't let him do whatever he wants. Not a sympathetic view of him at all. You know, I, I mean, he shot his bassist through the chest <laughs> at one point or part of the chest and shoulder, depending on the report, and was somewhat plausibly accused in court of murdering one of his former wives. The fact that Great Balls of Fire was neither one of those films means to me it was a very well-produced failure overall, even though I loved certain elements of it. Anyway, back to the first shows after you know, that Friday night and that weekend. Uh, the account written in Hellfire by Nick Toshis is thus... Jerry Lee and Myra were driven to the Regal Cinema in Edmonton where the tour was to begin. Some 2,000 British teenagers sat in a murmurous anticipation, so perfect that it seemed to be orchestrated. The theater lights dimmed, and the Headley Ward trio, an English musical comedy act, performed and were politely applauded. Then came the Trenchiers, the black jive rock group led by the Alabama twins, Claude and Clifford T Trenier. Trenier, probably. Now 39 and fading from fame, they were applauded less politely, more enthusiastically. For minutes afterward, there was nothing but the murmurous anticipation renewed. So then when uh, Jerry Lee takes stage with his backup band, including Myra's father on bass, portrayed, as we said, by John Doe <laughs> in the film, and Mojo Nixon on the drums, uh, that would be, let's see, J.W. Brown on bass and Russ Smith on drums. Jerry Lee, let's see, back to the text. Jerry Lee gave them little more than 10 minutes. He treats his audience with an attitude bordering on contempt, one British reporter wrote a few days later. And the teenagers, those who had been loud with excitement, those who had been silent, began to jeer and hiss as the curtain fell. Someone started to sing God Save the Queen, and others joined in amid the jeering and hissing. Finally, the curtain rose, and Jerry Lee gave them more. Gave it to them hard and frenzied and unrelenting. 
as a man who lay lustful and betrayed upon a hated wife. And then he left the stage. On the following morning, Sunday, May 25th, the Daily Sketch said that Jerry Lee throws together everything that is bad in rock and roll. Drooling at the piano, Lewis moans, grunts, wails, and sneezes so close to the microphone he might be eating it. A front page editorial in The People was more hostile, calling for all teenage subjects of the Crown to boycott Jerry Lee's concerts and thus show that even rock and roll hasn't entirely robbed them of their sanity. The editorial also urged the Home Secretary to have Jerry Lee immediately deported from the United Kingdom. That afternoon, a reporter from the Daily Herald crept into the Westbury Hotel and snake-tongued his way into room 116, where he found Myra's mother, Lois. In his front-page story the next day, the Herald reporter wrote in his own italics that she lay in bed, nylon nighty clad smoothing her dark hair with one hand and holding a sheet close to her throat with the other. Then returning to Roman type, I'm horrified, she said. Back in Memphis, Jerry phoned Myra a lot. Then one night, he said he was taking her to a movie, but they didn't go. They got married instead. The reporter proceeded to room 122, where he found Oscar Davis, who came to the door wearing only a pair of short pants. Finally, he came to room 127, Jerry Lee and Myra's room. I knocked. Jerry answered. I can't come out. I haven't got any clothes on. Myra Gale and I couldn't have cared less, Frankie Jean recalled. We were running around shopping, drinking Cokes, eating ice cream. That Sunday night, Jerry Lee and Myra were driven to the Kilburn State Theater in London for a second show of the tour. On the following day, the Herald reported that only 1,000 of the theater's 4,000 seats were filled adding that those who stayed away missed nothing. On Monday night, an editorial in the London Evening Star said that Lewis should not be allowed to parade his charms before British teenagers. He should be deported at once. He is an undesirable alien. Later that night, Jerry Lee performed at the Granada Theatre in Tooting, where he was met by cries of cradle robber. He beheld his audience, slowly drew the silver comb from the pocket of his yellow pants and ran that comb back through the eight inches of fine blonde waves, hair better by far he knew than any that his audience might ever possess. And when he did this, there were cries of Sese! He was scheduled to appear the following night at the Odeon Theater in Birmingham. But that morning, the British agent Leslie Grade, who helped book the tour, met behind closed doors with the president of the Rank Organization, which owned the theaters that Jerry Lee had been booked into for the rest of his long tour. At the meeting, Grade announced the tour had been canceled. At 2.15 that afternoon, Jerry Lee, Myra Gale, Frankie Jean, Russ Smith, J.W. Lois, and Little Rusty left the Westbury Hotel through a side door as Oscar Davis stayed behind to try to claim money from Leslie Grade and the rank organization. Limousines carried them to the airport where reporters and photographers were waiting. Leading Myra past them, Jerry picked up a paper at the airport newsstand and glanced at the headline, which proclaimed that France's new premier had averted civil war. Who's this de Gaulle guy, he said loudly, and as the newsman caught up with him. He seems to have gone over bigger than us. He then hugged Myra and answered questions from the reporters. One reporter wanted to know what Jerry Lee thought about the British. You British are nice on the whole, he said, looking into the man's eyes, but some of y'all are jealous, just plain jealous. Another reporter wanted to know if Jerry Lee thought that the scandal might hurt his career. Back in America, I got two lovely homes, three Cadillacs, and a farm. Then he squeezed Myra's hand and said, What else could anyone want? Now, to keep reading straight from Toshi's here, because uh, I think it's not the average writing, so I can't just take it and repurpose it and skim through it like I do some others, but I do read it right after Ed Ward to sort of display the disparity in detail between the two authors. Alliteration. Uh, not that Ed Ward was ever, you know, charged with the responsibility of writing Jerry Lee Lewis's life story, but when you get somebody that actually, you know, hunts for all the details, puts it all together, and tells a story really well, 
compared to someone who's just doing a history of rock and roll and is trying to just hit the beats as best they can, you see the difference between their different storytelling approaches. Back in England, they're sort of celebrating how they have exposed and ex, uh, ex, expelled, yeah, expelled this rock and roll interloper from the American South, who is clearly incredibly immoral. And uh, the, the London Daily Herald <laughs> had a headline, Baby Snatcher Quits, <laughs> on that Wednesday. The Jerry Lewis Circus flew sadly out of London last night, 12 hours after two big British theater circuits had stopped his five-week rock and roll tour. Uh, so he gets back home, and it's such big news. There's a reporter there from the New York Post. I mean, it's Idlewild Airport in New York, so I'm, I'm not saying he flew straight home to, you know, Tennessee. But, you know... Like, rock and roll is a big deal, and actual newspaper reporters are there. I mean, New York Post is trash uh, today, has been, I think, seen as that for a long time. At least ever since Public Enemy wrote a song about them in 1990. But, uh, I don't know, in 1958, 9? I'm not sure what the public perception of the New York Post was. But there's a guy from the New York Post there asking Jerry if uh, he had been deported. And calmly, Jerry tells him, I wasn't deported. It's just that the English don't react to rock and roll like Americans. They don't scream. They just clap. I like screaming myself. I guess you could just say I got homesick. What? That doesn't, that, that wasn't the question that was asked, but it's a nice, it's a nice swerve, I guess. Um, you know, they asked Myra Gale what she thought of the whole situation. And she just said, I think what Jerry thinks about it. Um, someone from the Daily News asked if he didn't think it was a bit odd for a man to marry a 13-year-old girl. And that's when he says, you can put this down. She's a woman. That was covered, obviously, in the Edward testimony previously. Um, So they're in New York, and the debut of the film High School Confidential is happening that Friday, two days later, in the Lowe's State Theater in Times Square. They did not stay for this. They bailed. They went home uh, on Capital Airlines, back to Memphis, Tennessee. And then uh, when they get to that airport, again, there's reporters and photographers waiting for them. And these ones are no more kind or pleasant or polite than the ones in London or New York. In the next day's edition of the aforementioned Press Scimitar, um... One reporter who had greeted Jerry Lee at the airport commented that fans don't crowd around the Lewis home on Diane as they do around the Elvis Presley place. That's one thing that was shown in the film that I think was kind of, uh, I guess, pertinent to the story. Uh, they, they used it to kind of build a narrative that was, I don't know if it was necessarily true, about the sort of shitty feelings between Elvis and, and Jerry Lee. I don't think that was a huge element in his life or not enough to be in a biopic, but I think it was a good image to use that there was a lot of eh, competition for the public's attention and in the same neighborhood to major rock and roll stars. So what does Sun Records and Sam Phillips do to deal with all this controversy? Um, They, (laughs) within seven days of Jerry Lee coming home, release a novelty record that is titled The Return of Jerry Lee. And this was put together by Jack Clement, uh, who I mentioned earlier, but didn't talk much about. He was one of the employees of Sun Records. It was basically a spliced up series of questions and answers. They took recordings of Memphis disc jockey George Klein, uh, and they gave him questions to ask, and then they would splice in little chopped up out of context responses from Jerry Lee's previous records. So, you know, when they, Clement has Klein ask, what did Queen Elizabeth say about you? Then the audio response is him singing, goodness gracious, great balls of fire. Ha 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 ha. Then Jerry Lee decides maybe the best thing to do is to have another wedding ceremony with Myra to prove how dedicated he is. And I guess make it double extra good 
were double extra legitimate. They go to, um, you know, Faraday, Louisiana, where he's from, and fill out a marriage license at the parish courthouse in Vidalia. Uh, since the last time Jerry had been married in Louisiana, six years previous, uh, he didn't marry Myra in Louisiana. I think it was Mississippi he married her in because of the age, the age difference, or the age of consent for marriage there was lower than Tennessee. If I'm, I'm sorry if I'm wrong about it being Mississippi, Alabama, I, whatever. It was, I'm not looking at a map right now. I'm not looking it back up. I'm not looking up their marriage license right now for you people. But since last time he was in Louisiana getting married, there's a new agenda item on the license form to fill out. Relation of bride to groom. And Jerry wrote, none. So they have a second marriage with a family there. All approving, again, I mean, they didn't approve the first time, but they're all there to approve. And then a few days later, um, Jerry and, and Sam Phillips pay for a full-page ad in Billboard magazine with an open letter that was printed on the June 9th issue. And it reads as follows. Dear friends, I have in recent weeks been the apparent center of a fantastic amount of publicity and of which none has been good. But there must be a little good even in the worst people. And according to the press releases originating in London, I am the worst and am not even deserving of one decent press release. Now this whole thing started because I tried and did tell the truth. The to I told the story of my past life as I thought it had been straightened out. And that I would not hurt anybody in being man enough to tell the truth. I confess that my life has been stormy. I confess further that since I have become a public figure, I sincerely wanted to be worthy of the decent admiration of all the people, young and old, that admired or liked what talent, if any, I have. That is, after all, all that I have in a professional way to offer. If you don't believe that the accuracy of things can get mixed up when you are in the public's eye, then I hope you never have to travel this road that I'm on. There were some legal misunderstandings in this matter that inadvertently made me look as though I invented the word indecency. I feel that I, if nothing else, should be given credit for the fact that I have at least a little common sense. And that if I had not thought the legal aspects of this matter were not completely straight, I certainly would not have made a move until they were. I did not want to hurt Jane Mitchum, nor do I want to hurt my family and children. I went to court and did not contest Jane's divorce actions. She was awarded $750 a month for child support and alimony. Pausing for a second. Jesus criminy. <laughs> Just putting it out there. Just releasing that information, holy smokes. I, I can't imagine what would make a person want to release the numbers ugh, uh, of, of those private, personal things that your ex-wife is getting. So, you know, kind of turning the public against her, essentially, in a very passive-aggressive way. Anyway, back to the text of his letter. Jane and I parted from the courtroom as friends, and as a matter of fact, chatted before, during, and after the trial with no animosity whatsoever. This is why they have, you know, they have publicity people to do all this for you, whether you like it or not, in the modern day. They write, they write these things while you're in a coma and put it out to the, to the press and the public. <clears throat> Back to the text. In the belief that for once my life was straightened out, I invited my mother and daddy and little sister to make the trip to England. Unfortunately, mother and daddy felt that the trip would be too long and hard for them and didn't go. But sister did go along with Myra's little brother and mother. I hope that if I am washed up as an entertainer, it won't be because of this bad publicity. Because I can cry and wish all I want to. But I can't control the press or the sensationalism that these people will go to to get a scandal started to sell papers. If you don't believe me, please ask any of the other people that have been victims of the same. Sincerely, Jerry Lee Lewis. So this is the time when Dick Clark gets a anonymous phone call from someone, you know, saying, uh, you know who this is, 
but don't say anything. I just want to tell you to watch out. Jerry Lee Lewis married his 13-year-old cousin and all hell's going to break loose. Uh, Clark would later say that in a very cowardly act, I decided to hold off further bookings for Jerry Lee on the show, for which I've been sorry ever since. I know that's a repeat of what we said earlier, but I just want to... I want to recount it here in those words from this author compared to the previous one. Um, it's, it's a big... It's a big freaking deal that someone that powerful would keep apologizing for it. Um, so two days after that press release that they put in, you know, that, that uh, Jerry and, and uh, <laughs> Sam Phillips posted in, in Billboard magazine, he's back in New York at a nightclub called the Café de Paris. Brand new, uh, opened up by a guy named Lou Walters. And Jerry Lee brings Myra with him. They stay at a suite in the Edison Hotel, and then um, he's asked to hold a press conference on the evening that they're opening this club. One of the people who attended the press conference was the columnist High Gardner. I'm reading now directly from Toshi's again in Hellfire, who commented that Jerry Lee's music possessed the contagious, almost frightening beat of a tribal drummer. You know, Jerry Lee said to him, all that stuff about rock and roll inciting to riot is trash. Music didn't do it. It had to come out somewhere. But anyway, I'm not a rocker. I'm a boogie-woogie man. Interesting to note that because in the interviews, of course, many years later, of course, you're, the way you present yourself is going to change. But in the interviews on the uh, Blu-ray for the Chuck Berry film, he talks about the other guys at Sun Records and he talks about how, you know... Uh, Carl Perkins and Roy Orbison and, and to an extent, I think Elvis Presley were more, and Johnny Cash were all like all rockabilly guys. And he was a rock and roll guy. He was trying to put himself more in the camp of Chuck Berry. He and Chuck were rock and roll guys. Um, so opening night doesn't go well to Cafe de Paris. Before this, you know, let's say a month previous, he had been able to fill auditoriums and theaters and things. But the Café de Paris was not even filled up that night, opening night, and many who came, um, and I'm going to quote again straight from Nick Toshi's, because he wrote the, he wrote the foreword for the, for the novel uh, Nightmare Alley, <laughs> the, first, the first chapter of Nightmare Alley uh, details what, what a what a geek has to do on the sideshow, the guy that bites the heads off of chickens and how you get a new geek when your old geek gets, you know, killed or leaves the circus and how you get him hooked, <laughs> how you find somebody that's hooked on booze and give him a free bottle every day and make him degrade himself by biting the heads off of chickens. So as I'm saying, Nick Toshi didn't write that story. He wrote the foreword to it because uh, he's about to kind of get into that territory here. And I love, I love the way he breaks, I love the way he breaks down the next page worth of text. And I'm just going to, I'm going to read this part straight. The Café de Paris was not filled that night, and many of those who came had the look in their eyes that Jerry had seen as a boy, in the eyes of farmers who stood waiting to enter a tent at the Concordia Parish Fair. A tent wherein an old man shaking and reeking of cheap whiskey and prepared to bite the head off of a squawking hen and swallow that small bleeding head in one shuddering gulp. Jerry Lee failed to return to the Café de Paris the following night as he had been scheduled to. Instead, he returned to the South, to the land of his ancestors. The summer passed, but trouble did not. On the first day of fall, Elvis, whose kingship Jerry Lee had dreamed to usurp, sailed in khaki to Germany. Before his departure, a reporter at the Brooklyn Army Terminal asked Elvis how he felt about what had befallen Jerry Lee. He's a great artist, Elvis said, shifting from his left hand to his right a book called Poems That Touch the Heart. I'd rather not talk about his marriage, except that if he really loves her, I guess it's all right. Not long after arriving in Germany. By the way, pause, pause for a second. I mean, that's some, that's some passive-aggressive trash talk right there. Like, 
I mean, you didn't ask if I think it's right or not, but I'm going to let you know that I think my opinion is important enough to tell you that I think their marriage is okay if he loves her sufficiently. <laughs> I like that. They didn't have Twitter back then. Sorry, I sound like an old man. But, but really, like, it, it, on Twitter, people just fire this, this, these opinions off nonstop, and it doesn't make a dent. It really doesn't matter for the most part. For most people, most celebrities trash talking each other they can just brush it off and move on to the next thing or create the next scandal or exciting thing to talk about instead that's part of the game this 1959 like your rock and roll star gets asked one question in a in a newspaper and he's like well i better make sure i give my sweeping judgment about whether or not it may or may not be a justified relationship not sticking up for JLE here, just saying that Elvis was pretty important and is buying into his own hype. Not long after arriving in Germany, back to the text, Elvis met and fell in love with a 14-year-old girl named Priscilla Bilyeu. He eventually brought her to live with him at Graceland, keeping her carefully, quietly, waiting until 1967 to marry her. Without taint. That's eight years, people. By the time Elvis sailed for Germany, Myra Gale knew that she was pregnant. On the morning of February 27, 1959, a few weeks after the plane crash that killed Buddy Holly, the Big Bopper, and Richie Valens, Myra Gale gave birth in Faraday to a seven-pound boy child. Later in the day, Jerry Lee decided to name his second son Steve Allen Lewis in honor of one of the few decent men he had met outside of Concordia Parish. Soon Jerry Lee moved his family into a new home at 5042 East Shore Drive out near Coro Lake. It was a fine ranch-style home with four bedrooms, a large patio, and a swimming pool. Jerry Lee would sit by the pool in early evening and that hour when the sun began to fall and the darkling Sighing colors came. He would sit there and not smile and not think. It was only a matter of time, he knew, till he would once again be redeemed. He would sit there, gazing at the tame, purling water. And he would know that. And he would make a fist, wishing that there were a horse that he could knock to its fucking knees. Now, let me talk a bit about books and about sources and about me taking a lot of liberties um, in ways that, you know, somebody a little more professional than myself, like Mr. Dan Carlin of Hardcore History, wouldn't do. Because that man's a consummate professional, and uh, he does inspire me a lot. He has inspired me to do direct readings from source material and give credit for it, which is what he does sometimes on his podcast, but he knows history so well, he generally doesn't dip into it as often as I do. Uh, that could be a crutch of mine, I'm happy to admit. Uh, but I, there are certain authors I love so much, I, I don't always want to distill what they convey into my own words. It feels lousy, um, and it makes me feel guilty. So, you know, if I don't do that, <laughs> granted, I'm not feeling any guilt about a certain author. Uh, and I feel it's necessary at this point to address the fact that Jerry Lee Lewis himself does have uh, his own story published with the help of uh, a gentleman named Rick Bragg. Uh, it came out in 2015, and I have not read it. Uh, I am biased, for sure. I am prejudiced uh, in, in the terms of prejudging this approach. I think I would like to read it someday, but I did not feel it was 
incumbent upon me to read before recording this. I have a bunch of different sources, and I'm not even done pulling from them yet for this very episode. I know you just heard <laughs> you just heard what was beginning and closing music for the previous two episodes, uh, you know, Amazing Grace, but I'm not ending this episode yet. I got more stuff to talk about. And I feel that I, it, it's worth saying that my, my bias and my prejudice and my, uh, my, my thought about him finally putting out his own story this late in life is generally it's going to be one of two things. It's going to be someone claiming a lot of things he used to say don't hold anymore, claiming things that uh, supposedly happened as part of his myth didn't actually happen. Okay, fine. That's, and I think that's totally uh, justifiable for someone telling their own life story. I don't care to read it. I don't care to read a whole book of demystifying things unless it's about Kiss, which is someone we'll get to very, well, maybe not very soon. Uh, I want to see Kiss demystified because they're a, a wacky gimmicky band that did a lot of amazing things and, and kept a lot of secrets. I don't see Jerry Lee Lewis as the guy that has a lot of secrets that I want demystified, right? Or brought to light. I don't care about uh, him trying to set the record straight about a lot of these things. It's not interesting to me. And he, his accomplishments have been very well chronicled by a lot of other people. I don't feel like his, you know, excuse me, but drug-addled, violent brain is going to keep track of things better than the people I've been reading from. Again, I'd be happy to read this book, just I don't feel like I'm under the gun to do it. I don't feel like it's necessary for getting across the finish line for these three episodes about Jerry Lee Lewis, and I don't believe I'm being disrespectful necessarily by saying that. Now, I want to talk a little bit about High School Confidential, the film. Um, unlike what I was doing and I am doing with Chuck Berry and his appearance in a film as a character, an ongoing character that's, you know, supporting the entire narrative of the story and the film that he was a co-star in with Alan Freed titled Go Johnny Go. I don't think this film needs me to break it down for a Jerry Lee Lewis episode necessarily. I might go back to it, um, to discuss some other elements. I mean, it looks like a really, from the pieces of it I've seen so far, it looks like a really cool 50s kind of trashier shock, you know, uh, juvenile delinquent film. You know, not as high class as uh, what was Rock Around the Clock, which is, as I keep saying, an episode we're getting to, and we're going to do Billy Haley and the, and the comments for that one. I beg your pardon, but my brain fart. Not Rock Around the Clock. That wasn't the name of the film. It was Blackboard Jungle with Rock Around the Clock featured prominently in it. And that I cover, I will cover because it was such a phenomenon in theaters when the song Rock Around the Clock would play. It caused such a violent reaction with teenagers. They had to cut the intro credits to that film to keep showing it publicly and not get like the seats ripped out of theaters. Not so much with High School Confidential and Jerry Lee Lewis. Um, I do want to mention it because of a few things. It starts with Jerry Lee on the back of a pickup truck in his band, uh, his bassist that he, you know, his bassist played by John Doe in uh, Great Balls of Fire and his drummer played by Mojo Nixon in Great Balls of Fire. No guitarist as played by Jimmy Vaughn in Great Balls of Fire. I rarely ever see uh, footage or images of that band at that time with, you know, with, with a guitarist backing him up, but I'm sure that, that, that happened from time to time. I'm not saying it didn't. Uh, they look super cool, you know? It's, it's as cool as when you, if you saw the, the It's a Long Way to the Top If You Want to Rock and Roll video by ACDC from a parade in, in Australia, I think Sydney, Australia, it, when they're playing on the back of a pickup truck. I wonder if it's because of this movie that they wanted to or just because it's a cool thing to do if you're in a rock and roll band. I mean, let's be honest, who wouldn't want to do that? I think the thought of that is fresh in my mind because I just watched a John Mayer video, which is clearly an almost shot-for-shot shot tribute to uh, the Eric Clapton, I think, Bad Love video. <laughs> or either Bad Love or Forever Man, I forget which one it is, from the late 80s. Um, I mean, John Mayer's wearing a similar jacket. He's, he's got the same crane-operated camera and the same sort of shots of this sound stage where there's no one hanging out but him and his super professional band just, just doing their thing. And I'm not even a fan of John Mayer. I'm just so impressed. 
Um, I'm not knocking the guy. He's amazing. He's a, an incredible talent, deserves a lot of respect and a lot of love. And he already gets it, so he doesn't need me to pile any more on him. But Jerry Lee doesn't factor into the story of High School Confidential so much. Um, he, you know, his music opens the, opens the movie and then plays over the end credits. But it just sort of made me think back to Great Balls of Fire and the High School Confidential scene in that film with Dennis Quaid playing Jerry Lee just rolling up to the high school in his car and jumping out and singing his song while it's playing and all the kids coming out and, you know, like Winona Ryder, you know, dancing and going crazy because Jerry Lee Lewis is so famous. And as I said in the previous episode, it seems very much the kind of thing that they wanted to, to use to pitch this as a musical, as a stage musical. I don't understand why they wouldn't have just used that chance in that scene to portray the making of the film High School Confidential instead show them on the set, recreate what that might have been like, get the story from Jerry Lee, what was going on that day. Did they have fun? Was it cool? Were they obnoxious? Did they throw bottles at people? Did they get angry at the crew? My guess is probably, but they don't show him being unruly and violent until like the very last montage in the film of more of Jerry Lee Lewis's bad behavior, which is a point that I've made previously. But it bears repeating now that I've gone back and watched, uh, you know, the, the opening of High School Confidential. And made me think more about how good Great Balls of Fire could have been. Now I want to dip into the notion of where Jerry Lee, you know, got a lot of his piano influence. Because there's some contention about that. Um, based on what I'm reading from Nick Toshi's in Country, The Twisted Roots of Rock and Roll, which features a very... Uh, long section about Jerry Lee compared to the amount of page space he gives to everybody else. Maybe check out, you know, this book. If you really care about the history of rock and roll and country music, absolutely. Uh, especially the Emmett Miller chapters. I did a reading of one that I put up on my SoundCloud that I should probably, I, I don't know if I'd feel good about tossing it up in the feed of this, uh, just making it a podcast. Cause it is, it is just me reading that whole chapter of Dick Toshi's as an audiobook, and he hasn't given me permission to do that. So maybe I'll include a link to it someday, somewhere. <laughs> but I better also include a link to Nick Toshi's Amazon author page, just so I don't feel bad. <laughs> but anyways, in, in his uh, chapter, Loud Covenants, he discusses a few direct influences on Jerry Lee. The first is Del Wood, whose full name was Adelaide Hazelwood, uh, she was born in 1920 in Nashville, had one major hit with a song called Down Yonder in 1951, which was an instrumental on the uh, Tennessee record label. He also mentions, uh, let's see, let me get this right, um, a jazz pianist from Iowa named Merrill Moore, M-E-R-R-I-L-L-M-O-O-R-E, who recorded songs like House of Blue Lights in 1953 and Down the Road a Piece, 1955, for Capitol Records. But one that he wants to emphasize, Nick Toshis wants to emphasize, is Cecil Grant, uh, African-American singer, pianist, born in Nashville, 1915, died uh, because of pneumonia and alcohol in 1951 and started recording in 1944 for uh, labels like, get ready, Gilt Edge, Bronze, Four Star, Sound, Bullet, Dot, Downbeat, Swing Time, Imperial, and Decca. So he recorded a lot of songs. Uh, Nashville Jumps in 1947 for Bullet Records is one that Nick Toshi specifically singles out as a great boogie-woogie party record that would have been a big influence on Jerry Lee Lewis's playing style. But then one he singles out as even more important than that is We're Gonna Rock from 1950, from July, uh, recorded up in New York City for Decca Records. He claims that the intro, the piano intro riff for We're Gonna Rock is pretty much Jerry Lee's style, all wrapped up in a nice little package. He also mentions that his, you know, boogie-woogie piano style was pretty well in line with Ike Turner, who is playing with, you know, under uh, releasing stuff under the name Jackie Brenston, like Rocket 88, 
great stuff. One of the first, another one of the first rock and roll songs ever released. And that's kind of the problem I have with the Elvis Presley debate when people want to get fussy about who was the king of rock and roll or who invented rock and roll. There are so many artists, you know, Boogie Woogie and rhythm and blues artists that came before Sun Records started cranking out hits with white people that had the words rock or rock and roll or rocking all night or whatever in them and had that same rolling boogie woogie bass line on the piano. That's the basic, you know, <laughs> approximation of boogie woogie. With your right hand, really kind of staccato stuff, while your left hand just never stops rolling. It's just up and down, up and down, like a river. It's just like a river flowing. Um, I'm going to get way, way into why I think Chuck Berry is the real father of what became rock and roll, especially instrumentally and especially on guitar, in another episode. But it, it does. It's more to do with taking that swing of the boogie woogie beat and then playing your main instrument, which is the electric guitar, very hard and straight on the beat, not behind it like you would with the rest, like the rest of the band swinging. And he played right up on the one, two, three, four, and that dissonance in the rhythmic push and pull is what made rock and roll what it became for the rest of time. Up to this point, though, it's debatable, I think. Who was rock and roll and who wasn't? I think it does come down to a labeling of the genre. Alan Freed, of course, factors into Chuck Berry's life very, very prominently there by calling it rock and roll on, on the radio. Anyway, story for another time, debate for other, other days. A couple of the things I should mention about High School Confidential before I move on is that it was his last appearance in the top 10 of the country charts because he was still being played on country charts and tracked on, as a country artist at that time until way later in 1968. And in the early 70s, he had kind of a country comeback as well. He dedicated more time to that kind of music and it, and it made him a lot more money. And the song was released on Sun Records, uh, a 45 single, and it became... Uh, a number 21 hit on Billboard charts. This movie uh, was created, I guess, by producer Albert Zugsmith, who had done Sex Kittens Go to College previously, and the director, uh, Jack Arnold, who is famous for The Incredible Shrinking Man, among others. It's, it's, a, it's a great B-movie uh, exploitation kind of film. From what I've seen so far, as I said, I haven't finished watching it all yet, but I know Jerry Lee's only in the first part. So I've gotten through, I've gotten through uh, the, the first few scenes in the film, and I have to note this for any other fans of White Zombie, you're going to hear four drops, four s audio samples that you recognize from White Zombie's La Sexorcisto, Devil Music Volume 1. I... I'm the biggest White Zombie fan I know. I'm also the biggest Jerry Lee Lewis fan I know, and I didn't even know about this. Uh, I knew about all the samples that Rob Zombie had used from things like Faster Pussycat, Kill Kill, and Night of the Living Dead. When I was a teenager, I found those sources. Uh, but this one, I was, I was shocked. I, you know, it's, do you want to start a rumble? And uh, Drop It Buster, both come from this, uh, same character. Uh, there's a there's a, the only thing square about this world is the cats what live in it is, is from this movie. And also, the beatnik poet, uh, poetess <laughs> offering about, uh, turn on to a thousand joys, smile on what happened, then check what's gonna happen, you'll miss what's happening. Turn your eyes inside and dig the vacuum, tomorrow's a drag which you actually can hear today uh, in the opening montage, audio montage for the Dana Gould Hour, if you like comedy podcasts by comedians. There's a lot of super cool 50s uh, young person slang and, and confrontational talk and, and, uh, and uh, violence. And there's drugs, and there's Mamie Van Doren, and a couple of other gorgeous blondes, if you're into gorgeous blondes. I know some people are. Let me get back to what I was saying earlier about 
authors about the narrative voice that I find very agreeable. I am not at all implying that Nick Toshis is an unbiased biographer of anyone. I think I just prefer his use of language and his presentation better uh, than anyone that is pretending to be unbiased. I think he's a poet compared to, I mean, almost any rock journalist and or music biographer I've ever read. He's too good. But he gets away with a lot because of that. He uses language to kind of create filler that doesn't feel like filler. It's very nutritious. It, it warms the soul, unlike everybody else who forces their opinion on you in a very transparent way. Again, I can always go back to Mick Wall for that <laughs> sometimes when he's at his worst. But when Mick Wall's at his best, he is fantastic. Uh, but let's talk in terms of Charles White, the writer of the authorized biography of Little Richard. In this book, he kind of tag teams the reader with Little Richard himself and other members of Little Richard's crew uh, that were supposedly there at the time when certain events took place. Now, you've heard me read straight from Tashi's, and you're going to hear me read from him straight off the page again before we're done with this episode. Dig this by comparison, Charles White's narrative. This is from the chapter, It Ain't What You Do, page 145, on The Life and Times of Little Richard. There was an atmosphere in Detroit's Cobo Hall that September night that made your hair grab your collar. The electric energy of 13,000 people poised on the edge of an experience that they all knew was going to be mind-blowing. Well, did you set that up for us properly, Charles? Do we know that they would think that way? I don't, not sure. Like a world title fight, Little Richard and Jerry Lee Lewis, those kings of the rocking piano, were about to battle it out on stage. It was a brilliant piece of promotion. Harking back to the excitement of the 40s and early 50s, when the jump bands would get together at the same venue, trying to blow each other off the stage in a battle of the bands. Little Richard and the Killer, both 100% full-throttle performers, both just clawing their way back into the big time. After 10 years in the doldrums, there had already been a managerial battle behind the scenes. Both stars had insisted on closing the show and therefore, in the unwritten rule of show business, topping the bill. Pausing for a second. This is a theme with all three of these kings of rock and roll. Chuck Berry, Little Richard, Jerry Lee Lewis. Never a problem with Elvis because he was on top of everybody to do whatever he wanted. But those three guys, the triumvirate, that were not Elvis, I mean, they were still having to fight for that dominance every, every single time. Richard had lost. Jerry Lee Lewis's smoldering redneck prejudices and monster ego were a byword in the business. Right here is where I want to say, give me something, Charles White. Give me something real. I want to hear this qualified. I want some facts. I want some details. Even if you can't tell tales straight from somebody else's... Uh, Mouth in particular, what, what are you talking about? What are you insinuating? Uh, is, he, is he difficult to work with for racial prejudice reasons? Uh, does he not like, you know, uh, double billing with other piano players? Does he, do he and Little Richard have a thing going on? What else has he, you know, what else has he done to, to Richard? What else has he done? I mean, I, I've read a billion, a billion things that he's done that are objectionable, but... You're trying to set a scene here for someone that's reading about Little Richard only, and you're being very vague. So, say something like, black performers always seem to have a problem with him if you're going to use the phrase redneck prejudices. Huh? Or does just... But see, you can just say redneck prejudices and leave it there and let the, let the innocent reader formulate something else in their own head because you don't have the balls to say, he was a racist dickbag. <laughs> And I also find it kind of objectionable that uh, they're presenting Little Richard's story, unqualified, that he taught rock and roll to Jerry Lee Lewis. When, you know, in the movie Great Balls of Fire, we see him and his cousin sneaking out to go watch black piano players play Boogie Woogie. And we also have, of course, the breakdown we were given by Nick Toshis. 
just just to compare one author's narrative to another author's narrative to a movie's narrative. And if I have any ulterior motives here, it's not on the part of cheerleading for any particular artist as much as it is trying to encourage critical thinking, especially in the young people. If there are any young people <laughs> listening to the history of rock and roll in film and rock and roll. Back now to the words, the words of Charles White. In the days of Alan Freed, package shows he had so resented being forced to go on before Chuck Berry in Berry's home city of St. Louis that he played 30 minutes of viciously hard rock and roll, then took out a can of lighter fuel, poured it on the piano, and put a match to it, telling the stage crew as he stomped off, I'd like to see any son of a bitch follow that. The stage was set for two epic performances, and the crowd couldn't wait. So, a couple things there. Uh harkening back, or harking back, as the author says, to the Chuck Berry story. I just had to throw it at you one more time from another writer's perspective. Another, uh, another change in the dialogue there and, the, and what kind of an insult he would throw at Chuck. But in this case, not into Chuck's face, just to, to stagehands. And I'm, I'm digging into Mr. Charles White a little bit because I'm fresh from an episode about Chuck Berry where I read straight from a book about the history of chess records where the author was definitely biased against Chuck and wanted you to dislike him. So um, I think Jerry Lee has presented himself historically as someone that's not hard to dislike. I, I just, I like it better when facts are presented without a narrative that that makes you want to dislike him because of the words that the author chose. Um, and there's going to be a little more nudging from the author in, in a little bit. But between then and now, here are some words that are straight from Little Richard himself. And they relate back to what we were just talking about previously. When it comes to Nick Tosh, he's breaking down three different piano players that were big influences and obviously connected, if you listen to them, to his style. Little Richard says, Jerry Lee learned how to rock and roll from me. He was just a country singer till he heard my songs, and he recorded a lot of them. I hadn't been in the business all these years to let Jerry Lee get top billing over me, so Bumps, I think that's his manager or associate that works with him on the road, and me got dis together to decide what to do. We planned to kill him dead, so to speak. I went out there shining like a diamond with my glass suit, and I really took the house. I gave it all. I used Lucille again. I made them lift the piano over the middle of the stage, while they were playing that riff, I sang all my hits. I had that audience right in the palm of my hand. I jumped on the piano and threw them my boots. I did a couple more songs. Then I threw them my glass suit, and they tore it to bits for souvenirs. I finished up in just my pants and socks. I sang Jenny Jenny, Tutti Frutti, Oopa Doopa Doo, Oopa, wait, Oopoopa Doo, excuse me, my fault, and then Boney Maroney. I talked to that crowd about how I got started. Then I noticed Mitch Ryder and the Detroit Wheels were in the front row. Detroit is Mitch, Mitch's hometown, and he got his break in the business with two of my songs. I got him up to take a bow. The audience really liked that. Then I ended with Long Tall Sally and left it to Jerry Lee to try to take them higher. Stop right there. I love that ending. I love how supportive that sounds. I love his choice of words. I left it to Jerry Lee to try to take them higher. Very much, you know, the opposite of Jerry Lee's cranky attitude toward Chuck Berry. And no, I'm not doing a Little Richard episode right now. I'm just showing you some things to, for comparison for Jerry Lee. Uh, we're doing... We're going to do the hell out of a Little Richard episode or two for sure, because we're going to cover the biopic that I'm watching right now, and we're going to cover The Girl Can't Help It with Jane Mansfield. That's a ring a bell for any of you that are around my age that first heard the names Mamie Van Dorm and Jane, Jane Mansfield, spoken by John Travolta in the Jackrabbit Slims scene in Pulp Fiction. We all knew who Marilyn Monroe was, obviously. So here goes uh, the narrative back to the author. Lewis opened with a slow country song, You Win Again, which, stepping aside for a second to, to interject, probably my favorite Hank Williams song of all time. If you've never heard it, check that one out, man. Oh, it's, it'll destroy you. Uh, followed by the similar tempo 
One Has My Name. When the audience, hyped up for rock and roll by Richard's set, started to call for great balls of fire and a whole lot of shaking, he blew his top and shouted back at them, The door is open and there ain't no stop sign on the way out. Jerry Lee is notorious for his treatment of audiences. <laughs> That's probably not untrue. He plays what he wants to play and does not take kindly to suggestions. He told a restive audience in Germany, who booed him for playing country music instead of rock, If you don't like what I'm doing, you can kiss my ass. The door swings both ways. <laughs> That's great. When Lewis did start to play his rock and roll hits and looked as though he might be getting the audience on his side... Richard moved in for the kill. Timing his entrance beautifully, he appeared in the center aisle, giving away and signing photographs of himself. As people crowded around to take them, he moved slowly out of the auditorium, taking a large part of the audience with him, like the Pied Piper of Hamlin. Jerry Lee was left facing rows of empty seats. Now, I, I don't know that that didn't happen. But I would like more details. I would like maybe a number of how many people, because he just says a large part of the audience. That can mean anything. Rows of empty seats can mean anything. That could have been 10 people. But I love the, I love the image of it. I, I love, I love the, the, the dirty tricks. I love the old days of, of show business. Actually, the later days of show business, but you know, in the early days of rock and roll. I thought that was really cool and worth sharing. I hope you enjoyed it. Uh, I think that probably did happen to, to some extent. Maybe not the extent that the I don't know, author wants you to fill in those blanks for yourself. But by comparison, I'm going to jump back into Nick Toshi's from the book Country, Twisted Roots of Rock and Roll. On the afternoon of... September 29, his 41st birthday, Jerry Lee shot Norman Butch Owens, his bass player, in the upper chest with a 357 Magnum. Owens survived, and Jerry Lee told police he thought the gun was empty. A hearing was set for 9 o'clock, October 14, but Jerry did not appear. The week after he shot his bass player, Jerry Lee was arrested at his home and charged with disorderly conduct. Neighbors had complained that Lewis was shouting obscenities at them. There had always been legal fires. Until 1975, Jerry Lee kept an office in Memphis. Jerry Lee Lewis Enter Enterprises Incorporated, Suite 805, 3003 Airways Boulevard. But one night, he blasted 25 holes through his office door with a 45 automatic, and he was asked to leave. Now, if you want to get a more uh, flowery account of this and more visual account of this, I highly recommend hopping on the YouTubes or whatever official channels you can find, maybe HBO, HBO Max, something like that. Tales from the Tour Bus by Mike Judge. And if you know who Mike Judge is, I love you. <laughs> if you know who he is and you're listening to me tell these stories, I love you so, so much. Uh, if you don't know who he is, that's not your fault. But he is the mastermind and the writer and creator behind things like Beavis and Butthead, King of the Hill, Office Space, Idiocracy, Extract, Silicon Valley, and Tales from the Tour Bus. Uh, there's a country season and there's like a funk season, I believe. It is animated recreations of supposedly true tales from the road of a lot of wild and crazy artists, but uh, told by people that were eyewitnesses as far as their story is concerned. Um, and there's a Jerry Lee Lewis episode that talks to a couple people that were there in the office building when this went down. They claim that uh, there, it was a Tommy gun, maybe. I, I don't know enough about guns to know if a forty five automatic if there's like a 45 caliber Tommy gun kind of thing, but their story is more that, and this could just be because they're old and addled and they did lots of, like they explain all the pills they were doing at the time and all the booze they were drinking. Um, it could be that he busted out the Tommy gun all the time, but in the case of this one instance, it was a 45 automatic that wasn't a Tommy gun, but how, who cares from, from me? Who, no one needs to hear this from me, so I'm moving on. But they talk about the fact that they got, you know, as the text said, they, he kept that office for a certain period of years, and they got booted out because, you know, J. 
Jerry would just use that office as a place to go after gigs or after partying at someone else's gigs. And he would blow off steam and just because the bars were closed and he didn't want to go home and he wanted to take his friends to his place and just keep the you know, party happening all night long and in the morning. Well, it was adjacent to a dentist's office. And when he blew a ton of holes in the wall, those 45 slugs went through and destroyed about a million dollars worth or of of dentures of uh you know whatever molded casted teeth <laughs> uh that couldn't be replicated unless you remolded somebody's mouth again so they got sued for that and had to leave the office building after defacing all that property I don't know how easy this would be to find, but there was a really, really old episode. I'm going to say it's at least eight years old of the Adam Carolla podcast back when I used to listen to that uh, all the time. Um, Before a lot of other things happened, not my cup of tea anymore, but I'm also also not obsessed with telling people to not listen to what he does. But there was a Dwight Yoakam guest episode that is one of the most entertaining podcasts I have ever heard. And Dwight Yoakam just keeps like firing off songs out of the blue. The, Adam Carolla asks him just, just to make up jingles for fake products, and he does it. It's amazing. And he tells a story of being, I believe it was in Hollywood, and, and being in a club where Jerry Lee Lewis was playing. And this is probably the 80s or 90s. And waiting for hours for him to finally get up on stage, and him showing up blitzed out of his mind and just banging on the piano and playing a, a few songs. And... And being clearly angry about certain people that were in the audience, I guess, that he was, he was griping at. <laughs> he got up and he like, was playing a song and like, he stood up and like, flipped off the crowd in one direction. And, hey, you mother lover, da 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 You know, swear word, swear word, swear word. And then, and then changed chords on the piano. And then, hey, you mother lover, swear word, swear word, swear word. And then changed chords again with his left hand while flipping off the third part of the crowd, going, and you mother banging on the piano, finished the song, and then told the crowd to go <laughs> whatever themselves, and then left. <laughs> he said it was the most amazing thing. Uh, now, he might not have said that. I might be just saying that because I would think it was the most amazing thing he'd ever seen. <laughs> but we are talking about a guy who in March of 1975, had his Convair 640 boarded at the Denver airport by federal agents who uh, (laughs) confiscated what they called a substantial amount of drugs. Lewis claimed uh, it was a total setup, and and of all the dope that was confiscated, no arrests were actually made. Um, A Convair 640 is... Is a plane of about, let's see, it's about 30 feet high, 100 foot, 105 foot wingspan, a length of about 82 feet, crew of three people, and seats 52 passengers. Not bad. In the early 1960s, Jerry Lee Lewis and his band, at that time were called the Memphis Beats, Memphis Beats, were all arrested at a motel in Grand Prairie, Texas, charged with possession of 700 amphetamine capsules. 200 were for the band, and 500 were for Jerry Lee. One story goes that when he was playing in a honky-tonk in Alabama for sort of a one-off date, getting paid in cash and then going home, um... Somewhere around the beginning of the second set, big drunk guy got right up in Jerry Lee's face and said, my wife's crazy about you. (laughs) She bought every record you ever made, but I think you're a piece of shit. And you know what I just did? I went home and busted every one of them records. What you think about that, boy? And Jerry Lee's only response was, good. Now she's got to go out and buy them all over again.
So let me take you into a story. Hmm. I want to do a couple more anecdotes before we wrap all this up. Uh, uh, this is a story I've read from multiple accounts or at least accounts after the fact. Uh, again, the more sort of Hemingway version would be to read it straight out of uh, the words of Nick Toshi's book, uh, Country, Twisted Roots of Rock and Roll. Um, and I think he does double it up a bit with uh, Hellfire as well. But, you know, he's, he takes some narrative liberties, or I would say fills in some blanks to make it read in a much cooler way. And uh, But I don't think it necessarily tells any lies. But instead of reading out of that, I want to go to uh, Elvis Australia, the official Elvis Presley fan club. The story I, I, is not mentioned in the Vince Gorolnik uh, two-volume epic about the life of Elvis. So I want to read it from www.elvis.com.au. And this is an article that was published in 2017 under the title, Jerry Lee Lewis Arrested at the Gates of Graceland. Interview with Jerry Lee Lewis. Now, I want to preface this by saying the fact that this occurred is backed up in a YouTube, not a YouTube interview, but an interview I found on YouTube (laughs) where he talks about it from his side, uh, Jerry Lee Lewis assassination attempt on Elvis, comma, Graceland arrest. You could probably find that live somewhere. Uh, And I will probably deviate a couple of spots in this narrative just to sort of give what I recall being his side of the story or his explanation for this in the early hours of november 22nd 1976 harold lloyd elvis's and the presiding guard on duty at graceland i I don't know wait elvis's and presiding guard all right elvis's guard harold lloyd uh, was greeted by an unexpected visitor jerry lee lewis Jerry Lee, accompanied by his wife, pulled up to the mansion's front gate in his new Rolls-Royce Silver Shadow. He asked Lloyd if he could see Elvis, but was told that the king was asleep. Lewis politely thanked Lloyd and drove away without incident. Later that morning at 9.30 a.m., Lewis flipped his rolls while rounding the corner at Peterson Lake and Powell Road in Collierville. The police report on that incident stated that the breathalyzer test yielded negligible results but that Lewis was obviously tanked on something and that he was charged with driving while intoxicated, reckless driving, and driving without a license. After the infraction, Lewis most likely returned to his home to rest. On November 23rd, 1976, less than 12 hours later, he was holding court at the Vapors, one of his favorite Memphis night spots. For reasons that are still debated, Lewis decided to leave the Vapors at about 2.30 a.m. Precisely. 2.50 2.50 a.m., almost 24 hours later to the minute, he again pulled up to Graceland, this time in a new Lincoln Continental. The car wasn't the only thing that had changed from the night before. Lewis's manner was markedly different. He was armed, angry, and obviously inebriated. A dangerous combination for a man mere mortals call killer. He was out of his mind, man, recalls Lloyd. He was screaming, hollering, and cussing. Get on the goddamn phone! I know you got an intercon system! Call up there and tell Elvis I want to visit with him. Who the hell he think he is? Tell him the killer's here to see him. Lloyd panicked. I just put my arms up in the air and said, Okay, okay, Jerry, just take it easy. Lloyd retreated to the guard booth and picked up the house phone. One of the boys answered, and Lloyd appraised him of the situation. Lloyd was advised to call the cops and wasted no time in doing so. Moments later, Elvis himself rang down to the guard booth. Lloyd recalls their conversation precisely. Elvis was on the line, and he said, What? See, he used to stutter a lot when he got upset. What the hell's going on down there, Harold? I said, Well, Jerry Lee Lewis is sitting in his car, down here outside the gate, waving a Derringer pistol and raising hell. Elvis said, What's the goddamn guy want? I said, He's demanding to come up and see Elvis. He said, oh, I, I, I don't want to talk to that crazy son of a bitch. Hell no. I don't want to talk to him. I'll come down there and kill him. You call the cops, Harold. I told him I already did, and he said, good. 
When they get there, you tell them to lock his butt up and throw the goddamn key away, okay? Thank you, Harold. Elvis is said to have watched the whole drama on his closed-circuit monitors. Officer Billy J. Kirkpatrick was the first to arrive on the scene, though Lewis was still seated in his car. Kirkpatrick knew he was armed and approached with caution. The Lincoln's sole occupant sat staring out at the front window. When the police got to the open driver's side window, they found that the man was Jerry Lee Lewis. Balanced on his knee was a chrome-plated, over-under-style thirty-eight caliber Derringer pistol. Kirkpatrick ordered him out of the car, but Lewis would not comply. Kirkpatrick had to pull him out of the car, remembers Lloyd. He told him to keep his hands on the steering wheel where he could see him. Jerry said he just wanted to see Elvis, but Kirkpatrick told him to shut up. Now, Jerry, he had tried to hide his pistol by putting it between his knee and the door, but when Kirkpatrick opened the door, the damn gun fell out onto the floorboard. Now, aside here, in Jerry Lee's testimony on the, the, the interview footage, he wants everyone to know that he had been drinking champagne at the Vapors, which gets to his head in a different way. Apparently, this means something about how violent he got or weird he got. Also, he claims the owner of the bar was a great friend to him and gave him the pistol that very night as a gift. He said, I still have it. I never fired it that night. I've never fired it ever. It's never been fired. It was a gift, and it's still mine. He also said that he went to put it in his glove compartment And the bartender told him, or the owner of the bar, friend of his, told him, no, 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 don't put it there, put it on the dashboard. Because it's a crime if you're concealing it in your car in the glove compartment, but not a crime to sort of openly drive around with it, and uh, and, and, and you should have it out so anyone can see it. All right, I don't know. I wasn't, you know, I wasn't around in that town in those days. Maybe that's how it happened. Hey, back to uh, Elvis.com.au. Let's see. Oh, yes. Officer Kirkpatrick picks up the gun that that falls out of the car door. And it was cocked and loaded. Mr. Lewis was extremely unstable on his feet, his speech was slurred, and his breath smelled of alcohol. Mr. Lewis was appraised of, apprised of his rights and was arrested for carrying a pistol and being drunk in a public place. The police report states that on closer inspection, Kirkpatrick noticed that the front passenger window of Lewis's car was smashed in. This accounts for the deep gash on the bridge of Lewis's nose, obvious from his mugshot. Mugshot is included in the article online. According to Kirkpatrick's report, the injury was sustained from broken glass resulting from attempting to jettison an empty champagne bottle through the closed window of his 76 Lincoln. (laughs) Kirkpatrick and four other officers took Lewis away immediately, but Lloyd would receive another visitor before the night's end. He explains, when the wrecker came down and towed Jerry's car away at approximately 4 a.m., They hadn't much more than gotten out of sight when another car comes flying up the driveway and two guys got out. I recognized one of them as Jerry Lee's dad. He was laughing, saying, Ha ha ha, ain't this some crap, man? I just got the word that they've taken my son to jail. This guy with me here, he just got me out of the Hernando (laughs) jail. I just got out, and Jerry Dunn gone ahead. Sure enough, Elmo Lewis, aged 78, no less, was arrested at 7.30 p.m. on the 21st for speeding and driving while intoxicated. He spent two nights in jail and failed to make his court appearance scheduled for the morning of the 23rd, like father, like son, indeed. Oh yeah, here we go. Here is Jerry Lee Lewis's own account of what happened, as related by Kay Martin, the president of, of Lewis's fan club. Elvis called him and asked him to come out to the house to talk to him. Jerry was out on the town, and by the time he got to Elvis's house, it was much past when Elvis had expected him, and Elvis was asleep. Jerry had driven up after a sheriff from MS had given him a brand new handgun. So it's a sheriff in her accounting, not the bartender. Or bar owner. Pardon me. I mean, maybe they're one and the same. I don't know this town. 
Sounds like the beginning of a great novel, honestly. The sheriff and the, and the owner of the, of the Vapors is the same guy. I want to watch that movie. Again, make that movie, not the one you made in Great Balls of Fire. Anyways. Uh, since, let's see. Jerry had driven up after a sheriff from MS, had given him a brand new handgun, but since Jerry did not have a permit for a concealed weapon, he had it on the dashboard of his car, as the sheriff had supposedly suggested. The guard at Graceland asked Jerry what he was doing with the gun, and sarcastically, Jerry said he hadn't brought it to kill Elvis so the guy could chill out. He didn't. He called the cops. Jerry was PO'd, but the gun stayed on the dash the whole time. The situation blew over because it was a tempest in a teapot. The sheriff who had given Jerry the gun cleared it up too. Linda Gale, Jerry Lee's youngest sibling, interpretation of, 20, of November 23rd, also tells a similar story. Jerry Lee admitted to me that he had been partying and drinking and that he was a little bit out of it, Gale recalls, but he swore his intentions were good. He's very misunderstood, you see. It's a shame, really. By Linda Gale's account, it was Presley who wanted to see Jerry Lee, as told to her by her father, as he describes in the video below. Oh, below. Okay, there we go. Uh, look to elvis.com.au slash Presley slash Jerry Lee Lewis arrested at the gates of Graceland dot sh tml. Also, I'll just put the link in the description for this episode. So you can just click on it there. But I wanted it verbally just in case. Just in case someone would rather hunt it down by listening to me spell it all out. Maybe you're an internet sleuth who happens to be blind. Uh, he was depressed and called over to the Vapors hoping that Jerry Lee would come to Graceland and keep him company. She insists that Lloyd never even informed Presley of Jerry Lee's arrival and that Jerry Lee grew belligerent only because he feared for what Presley might do if he didn't see him. I would say that in Tashi's uh, book, he... He talks about the whole intercom conversation as well. So I think that's up for debate. At the, at the least, that's up for debate. I believe really and truly that the people who were associated with Elvis at that time were trying to manipulate him. He was supporting all of them financially, and it was in their best interest to keep him isolated, Linda Gale continues. Jerry really had no motive to lie. Why would he leave a place where he was having a perfectly good time to go down to Elvis's house and make a scene? Speaking as a person, this is your narrator now, speaking as a person who has left many bars many times for various reasons, uh, when you're a bullheaded independent person that has decided it's time to go, that's what you do. When you get an idea in your head that, hey, I think I'll go see my friend, the most famous human being in the universe. <laughs> And he lives right down the road. That's what you do when you're drunk off your tits. I mean, not that I've done that. I haven't had that friend or had anyone I needed to see that badly that time of night. Not in Seattle, anyway, where there's too many obstacles to run into. But back to Linda Gale. It just doesn't make any sense. He had this whole entourage with him and a couple of girlfriends, and they were having a great time. There was no reason for him to go down there other than that he was concerned for his friend. Linda Gale's voice takes on a halcyon quality when she remembers Elvis and Jerry Lee's friendship. She speaks of their mutual respect for one another and tells stories of them riding motorcycles together and even going on double dates. Yeah, I bet they did. There's more to her... Uh, I guess, interview account, but it doesn't, it doesn't relate to the actual scene of the crime or anything that happened before or after, just her talking about Jerry Lee uh, and his you know, relationship with Elvis. You can check it out yourself, and you can check out the uh, video footage. I will attach the presently functioning YouTube link for that in the description of this episode as well. So you can hear him telling you the name of the bar owner then that, and, didn't, and not saying sheriff. All right, now look, friends. I'm going to admit, uh, I'm starting to feel guilty about how much I want to read straight from Tashi's on this episode, but I don't have any other episodes, I think, that I'll be leaning on him so much. So if I ever meet the man and he wants to strike me down, vengeance and anger, peppering so many sections of my episode today with his direct words. 
even though I'm giving him credit and I am including a link in the description to his Amazon page as an author, well, I'll just have to take it. I'll take it gladly, and I'll be happy that you all got to hear his words to the extent that I could share them with you. Because <laughs> there's a scene in this book, again, country, the twisted roots of rock and roll, in the chapter Loud Covenants. In this case, the story will start on page 85 of the edition that I have. That I can't distill <clears throat> and I can't summarize. It's pure Toshis. <clears throat> and I, I share so many anecdotes from the life of Jerry Lee Lewis and so many of them that are violent and outrageous because that's what I feel viewers were cheated out of by the film uh, Great Balls of Fire. And quite frankly, men that live this way don't usually live so long. He is as... You know, in his own words, in the title of his own album, The Last Man Standing, when it comes to the Sun Records, quote-unquote, million-dollar quartet. And obviously not just them. I mean, we're talking Elvis is gone, Johnny Cash is gone, Roy Orbison's gone, Gene Vincent's gone, Carl Perkins is gone, and this man who is more violent and confrontational, all of them put together, is somehow still alive. And the most recent activity I, I've, I've found, actually, as of this recording right now, and we're talking about July 2021, um, according to Wikipedia, on October 27, 2020, on Lewis's 85th birthday, there was a live stream on YouTube um, and his official website and Facebook called Whole Lot of Celebrating Going On with appearances from Willie Nelson, Elton John, Mike Love, Priscilla Presley, Joe Walsh, and others, hosted by rock and roll legend John Stamos, Uncle Jesse from Jesse and the Rippers, uh, <laughs> the actor from sitcom Full House from the 80s and 90s. Um, so I'm going to jump uh, back to Tashi's here, but I also realize I, I neglected to talk about his appearance <laughs> at the Grand Ole Opry. Um, so apparently the thing is, most people at the Opry at the time that he went there to appear for the first time in 1973, um, you know, were... <laughs> allowed to perform maybe two songs and then there's a commercial break and then they move on to something else. But Jerry Lee just decided to, uh, you know, first of all, open not with a classic, but like a, a new single called another place, another time. And then bust out 40 minutes <laughs> of songs. And then, you know, invite a guest up there to play or sing with him and, you know, just do a whole lot of shaking, Working Man Blues, Good Golly Miss Molly, and a bunch of other old songs. And then he did the same thing when he was uh, inducted into the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame. He was one of the first people to ever be there, to be inducted there. And he's the one that started an impromptu extended jam session, you know, that was fairly... I mean, I'm guessing it was fairly directionless, but exciting and interesting to watch. And that's been the tradition at the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame ceremony ever since. That's just actually the thing that they've sold DVDs of for years. And again, not saying the man's a hero for being hard to deal with, but, you know, hip-hop has taken this over since the 90s. Rock and roll has largely left this throne of being a troublemaker vacant. All right, now, as I said, back to Tashi's. And again, I encourage you to buy his books. Even if you've heard me, even if you like take everything I've read straight from his pages on this podcast and put it in a little file and listen to it over and over again, you haven't cracked the surface of what this guy gives you in terms of narrative and in terms of actual information in his book about the history of country music or Hellfire his biography of, of Jerry Lee. I promise you that. If you buy them both and you somehow think that you're cheated because I've read too many things already, I, I'll, I'll let you chop my leg off. That's fine. 
But back to page 85. I attended a Jerry Lee Lewis recording session in Memphis. Pappy Lewis was there. On his way to the studio, Pappy had been chased down on the highway by the Memphis police as he rushed along in Jerry Lee's white custom-built Lincoln 1-F. C-541 at a speed of 110 miles per hour. Pappy's reaction to this situation was ingenious. He increased his speed until he put enough distance between himself and the police so that he was invisible to them. Then he skidded the car to the side of the road, jumped in the back seat, and waited. The police arrived in the moment. Glad you showed up, boys, Pappy said. That crazy man driving this car was like to get us killed. When he saw your light flashing, he stopped the car and ran off into them trees there. The cops stared dully at the vacant driver's seat. My son's Jerry Lee Lewis. He's making a record on Poplar Avenue, and I gotta be there. This is his car. I'm in no condition to drive myself. How's about one of you boys taking me? Jerry be pretty mad I don't get his car back to him. He was driven to the studio. Earlier in the day at Jerry Lee's office, the scene was something like this. Jerry was on the telephone, shouting. He's gonna sue me? You tell that son of a bitch husband of yours that if he tries to sue me, I'm gonna come over there and give him the biggest ass whooping he ever got in his life. There were perhaps 12 other people in the room. Everyone was drunk, and a few were falling asleep as Jerry shouted into the phone. It was 10 o'clock in the morning. For some reason, Jerry Lee was drinking bourbon and orange juice, a combination the color of wan excrement. He's on a health kick, somebody suggested. Pappy Lewis tried, excuse me, decided to try some orange juice in his bourbon, so he asked someone to give him the Tropicana container from Jerry's desk. Jerry Lee banged the hand with the receiver as it was about to touch the orange juice. From the wielded receiver, a woman's voice was faint and shrill. What the fuck was that? Jerry was indignant. What the hell are you doing my orange juice? A voice attached to the hand, a drunken voice, answered, It's for your father. Jerry Lee returned the receiver to his ear. Shoot, tell him to go buy his own fucking orange juice. You still there, darling? I'm going to pause for a second. As a child of the 80s, I can tell you Number one, that uh, orange juice was health food back in the 1970s and 1980s of America, even though it was highly concentrated sugar water, <laughs> mostly with all fibrous pulp uh, strained out away from it. So most health benefits besides the vitamin C were taken away. And uh, <laughs> uh, if you don't know, a receiver is a large piece of a telephone that you, you could probably, like, bash a, a badger's head in with, you know, with the ones from the 70s or 80s or 60s or 50s, for that matter. Uh, if, you're, if you're thinking about modern phones, it's, there's no relation. I don't know how far in the future we are right now while you're listening to me, okay? I know a lot of you are laughing, going, oh, Jay, you're a silly goose. Everyone knows what the receiver of a phone is. Anyways, I wanted to make sure no one in the future thinks that the receiver is a human being that he was yelling at and then hitting people on the hand with. Ahem. At the recording session was a one-armed man named Paul. He introduced himself. Mr. Lewis, you probably don't remember me. Right, Jerry said. Soon the one-armed man was very drunk and he beat his wife, who seemed to be a short Indian. She left him for good, it seemed. The one-armed man, I don't know if that means... He, was, he had beat her in the past and she had left and that's what he was telling people. I assume that's what's going on. Not that he beat her in front of everybody in this recording session. The one-armed man said, fuck her. He approached a girl who sat quietly in the corner. Hey, baby, what's shaking? He dangled his armless folded sleeve in her face. The girl was repulsed. Judd Phillips, who had been sleeping, said to the one-armed man, watch it or I'll snitch the other one off. Jerry Lee laughed low and dark. The girl ran from the studio. Pappy Lewis seemed to be speaking in Hittite. Only Jerry could comprehend him, or perhaps he was merely faking. You know you ain't supposed to drink, Pappy responded in Hittite and spilled an eight-ounce Dixie cup of whiskey into his lap, a deed he loudly regretted in Hittite. 
With Pappy was the son of his girlfriend. The future son-in-law was about 30, drunk, but not in the Hittite fashion. It surfaced that Pappy could not remember his fiancé's name, but he was sure the fiancé was mad with him. Give me a dime, call your mama, he said, in English or something like it. An obviously psychopathic youth with eyes the size of gall eggs ran about telling anyone he could catch. I'm a writer for TV Guide. I write about country artists. Did you ever hear of the Grateful Dead? They played at my wedding. My wife's a model. She poses for artists. She poses naked, tits, hiney, everything. She makes more money than you and me both. I hired a private eye to follow her around all day, and he keeps a little book of all the people she fucks behind my back. He's very expensive. Pause. Pause so I can take a, take a drink here and rehydrate my throat. A woman with bleached hair was referred to by all as the curse of the family. A distinction of awesome implication. A man dressed in black and carrying a bottle of Peter Pan port introduced himself to the curse of the family. Don't get fresh, she said frequently. He was the drummer with Bobby and the Spotlights, the house band at Hernando's Hideaway. Pause for your narrator to give a note. Hernando's Hideaway, never been, but great song. Check it out. If nothing else, you can find it on the Snatch soundtrack from the early 2000s, the Guy Ritchie film. I'm not going to look it up on my own hard drive to find out who the artist is or on the Googs. You give it a Goog. Back to the narrative. There was a pack of cigarettes sticking from each of his pockets. Every pack was open, (laughs) and he smoked from them variously. Memphis session organist James Brown was in the studio. The drummer from Hernando's Hideaway saw him and screamed, Oh my God, don't tell me Jerry Lee's got spooks in his band. The curse of the family applied lipstick. A Judd fell asleep on the floor. Jerry Lee gently kicked him awake and said, Take out your teeth and I'll marry you. Judd returned to sleep. Through all this, Huey Moe was trying to produce a record. Carl Perkins was in the studio, playing guitar on several cuts. Every few minutes, a large barefoot suet-thighed lady turned to Huey Moe and yelled, Make Carl Perkins play the blue suede shoes, please! Carl, a reformed alky, seemed ill at ease. Billy Lee Riley, the man who cut Flying Saucer's rock and roll for her son in 1957. Side note, look that one up, because it fucking rules. I saw so rock and roll. Uh, materialized, looking like 5,000 concentrated volts. He spread his hands before him as if holding a birthday cake. Man, I got me a pill this big, and when I take a bite of the damn thing, grows right back. Then he smiled, bearing a large space between his teeth, and departed quickly. It was the only recording session I ever saw that was fun. Well, friends, it's been a big old blast. I love you for coming through all this with me. I'm so happy to think about the fact that I may have people listening right now that started with the first Great Balls of Fire episode that I first published back in the February of this year, 2021, and then followed up with a second episode, and then took about six months to finish this one after deviating wildly into all kinds of other music and other stories and other movies. Um, Judging by the amount of downloads at this time, I don't think there's a whole lot of people that are angry at me for not finishing this up sooner, if you get my drift. Uh, The Jerry Lee saga is not the most popular of all the stuff I've published so far. But for those of you that were there with future Jay and present Jay and my mistakes early on and uh, have probably gotten to this episode thinking I don't know if he's really learned all that much eh, he might be right, but this is rock and roll alright, it doesn't (laughs) if it was perfect it would be something else as I've said in another episode, of the Janus episode this is not fucking NPR, alright this is a one man operation there are no, there are no subscriber dollars helping this out And uh, on that note, I would like to say, please, if you do enjoy this, there's a link in the description, or there should be, because I add it every time, to uh, a little 
contribution plate where you can buy me a book or pants or, you know, coffee or whatever I might use that money for, you can donate to this podcast. And I would really appreciate it if you did, um, since I'm pimping out other people's books and movies. And let's face it, they're all a lot well, a lot more well off than me for crying out loud. <laughs> I mean, this is not the kind of thing that lends itself to a Patreon. I mean, I'm not, I'm not a famous person or a comedian who I can just, you know, do this full time at this point. Uh, and just throw out a lot of extra fun stuff and behind-the-scenes production wackiness that would be helpful for big fans. Um, you're here for the content. You're here for the stories. You're here for whatever it is you can glean from, you know, these recordings. And I really, really do appreciate it. Um, rock and roll is the greatest thing that we've been given. It's perfect. And I'm happy we have it as long as we have had it and can have it. You yourself, I am also grateful for and want you to be around as long as possible. We all want you as long as we can have you. <laughs> so be good to yourself.